Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was the bodyguard of Azula. Naruto is banished from Konoha, but gives them the slip and boards a ship. Soon after, he is shipwrecked on Ember Island and is saved by Azula. Three years later, Naruto is Azula's bodyguard while she hunts for the Avatar, but did he see the last of Konoha? Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 53, To Chase and to Ascend. Location, Naruto and Kakashi. The second their feet hit the ground, they went after the Akatsuki member. They tore through the street, people either getting out of their way or getting pushed aside. Go higher up. Kakashi told Naruto. You'll be able to reach him faster. He nodded in agreement and veered off. He ran through the crowd, ignoring the screams and cries of surprise of people who leapt out of his path and over to a nearby building. He didn't stop once he reached the side of the building. He placed a foot on the wall and ran up it. Reaching the top, he leapt over the edge and raced across the rooftops. Without the people in the street in his way, he was able to run faster, gaining ground on Toby. But Toby saw him on the rooftops when he looked behind him. That's cheating. He complained, reverting back to the childish tone he used before. Before. If you're going to cheat, then I'm going to cheat too. He started to duck, weave, leapfrog over people, making them briefly shout and protest, and run alongside building walls, all the while flapping his arms like he was an idiot or trying to fly. But it served a purpose as it made following him more difficult. Kami, he's more annoying than when the fox is right. Naruto silently swore. Hey, I resent that accusation. The QB protested. Besides, we both know now that's all an act. If what we saw in the room was the real him, then we really have to be careful. Thank you, Captain Obvious. He leapt across the gap between rooftops before turning right, staying on Toby's tail. It was difficult, due to the fact he had to make to keep an eye on the Akatsuki member, while also making sure that he didn't crash into anything, which had happened before when he hadn't been paying attention. Kakashi stayed on the ground, running through the crowd, which had been thinning ever since they started. Normally, he would have tried to hit the target with a kunai so the target would be slower and would also leave him a blood trail to track. But what prevented him from doing that was the people in his way and the fact that Toby was all over the place as he ran. If he had been a less experienced shinobi, he would have gotten angry and started making mistakes. But he wasn't, he kept his cool and tried to keep his target in sight. Pretty soon, the three of them were running through empty streets, or for Naruto, empty rooftops. They had also traveled far from the royal palace and even the business district. They were now making their way through the slums. Naruto had to be even more careful now, one wrong step, and he would fall through the ceiling. But as he ran, he saw an opportunity present itself to stop Toby. He quickened his pace, running ahead of his target, and then stopped. Pulling out a couple of kunai, he threw them in the direction Toby was running, hitting the ground just, just in front of him. Ah, there are kunai in front of me. He screamed the obvious, skidding to a stop just short of them. Who threw those? He demanded, looking around exaggeratedly. When he looked up and saw Naruto standing on the rooftop, he yelped and ran down a different street, away from the paragon. Right where I want him, Naruto silently cheered. When he saw Kakashi make the turn to continue after Toby, he knew he had to get back in the chase, otherwise they would never catch him. He backed up to the other side of the rooftop, took a deep breath, and charged to the edge. He leapt across the wide gap between the different sides of the street, feeling like he was just hanging in the air for a brief moment. The moment ended when he landed on the other roof, rolling his body on impact and coming out of it in a run, catching up easily to Kakashi and Toby. Kakashi was slowly gaining ground as Naruto caught up with them. He quickly drew out a shuriken and threw at the side of Toby's head. The sound of it flying through the air alerted the Akatsuki member, as he did a sharp turn into an alleyway. Kakashi wasted no time as he made the same turn, 
flashing through hand seals. Dotan, Doria Hiki, Earth Style, Earth Style Wall. He cried out, slamming his hands into the ground. The ground in front of Toby shot up out of the ground, blocking his way with a wall that had four bulldog heads sculpted on it. You've got no place to run now. He declared as he stood in front of the orange masked Akatsuki member. Toby didn't reply, he simply looked at the top of the wall, gauging the distance to the top of it and the time it would take to get over it. Don't even think about it. Naruto warned him as he landed on the wall. We've got you, start talking. He ordered, pulling out a kunai. Very well, Toby said, his voice once again losing the childish tone he spoke with before. What is it you would like to know? Location. Location, Team Kakashi and Team Paragon. Well, now what do we do? Sai asked as he looked out the window Naruto and his former sensei had leapt out of. He couldn't see them anymore, so he pulled his head back in. We really can't do anything now. Saka pointed out from where he sat on the floor. What do you mean you can't do anything? Nadar asked looking frantically at them. You're not useful anymore, Nadar Roga. Sasuke told him as he walked up to the chair, then around it so he stood behind him. You know what that means. But, but I still have valuable information. He protested, desperate to find a way out with his life. You can't kill me when I have that to offer. You do realize that Akatsuki member offered us that same valuable information, which would probably be a lot better than what you would probably have, and all we have to do to get that information is to chase him down, right? Sakura asked. So, it's rather pointless to keep you around. But you don't know if they'll be able to catch him, so I'm still your best bet. You obviously don't know Naruto all that well. Azula said with a smug smirk. He'll catch him, there's no doubt in my mind about that. So, again, you're not useful. He tried to come with up with something that would keep him alive, but came up with nothing, despite racking through his brain several times over. Indeed, I am not. He admitted in a defeated tone. So, kill me already. Sasuke raised his hand, ready to strike the killing blow, only to stop when Jiraiya shook his head slightly. I have one question for you, Nadar, before you die. Why did you help the Akatsuki kill Koyuki? The toad, toad sage asked him. He didn't answer for a couple of seconds. When it looked like he wouldn't answer, he did. If I had succeeded in this mission, I would have become one of their members. It should have been my initiation mission. He gave a harsh, bitter chuckle. How wrong was I? Go ahead and kill me. My greatest wish has been fulfilled, now I can serve Lord Dodo in the afterlife. Was your greatest wish killing Koyoki? Suki asked him, anger in her voice. His chuckle turned to crazed laughter. I thought that would have been obvious. That bitch is dead and the land of spring with her. Long live the land of snow. He declared loudly and with glee. Everyone else shared a look with each other and all had the same thought. June walked away from the wall she had been leaning against and made her way to the door. She banged on the door a couple of times. Hey, could you come in here for a quick second? She called out to the other side of the door. The door opened and when Nadar saw who it was, his mind snapped. No. No, 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 no. He screamed. You're dead. You're supposed to be dead. How is this he would have continued ranting, had the sound of birds chirping not filled the air? He felt a shock hit his heart and filled his body with indescribable pain. The last thing he heard was Chidori, 1000 birds. Location, Naruto and Kakashi. How about we start off simple? Were the Akatsuki involved in Dotoes revolt? Kakashi asked the masked Akatsuki member. Of course, we were. Toby answered. He paid us to help him overthrow his brother's rule, and we did. That answer threw them a little bit. 
That was too easy. Naruto told him. Why would you answer so easily? I told you, didn't I? If you wanted to get the information you so desperately wanted, all you had to do was catch me. You did, so I will tell you what you want to know. He explained patiently, not bothering to look up at him. Was there anything else you wanted to know? No? Both Naruto and Kakashi shared a look that showed their disbelief and suspicion. They both knew something like this was simply too good to be true. Toby was not going to reveal everything about the Akatsuki, they could tell that by his choice of words. Why were you trying to have the daimyo of Spring and Princess Mickey killed? Kakashi demanded, turning his attention back to him. He took a thinking pose that purposely annoyed them. Well, if I had to be specific, Koyuki was for entertainment's sake, but Mickey was business. What the hell does that mean? Naruto asked. You call having a daimyo killed entertainment? No, I consider watching you all running around, trying to figure out how to keep her safe entertaining. Oh don't look so surprised. He admonished them. I told you already, I know how Kanoha Shinobi operate. What you were doing was obvious if one knew where to look. And Mickey was business? Kakashi repeated. You should have your ears either cleaned or checked, Kakashi. I already told you that. How is she different? He asked. Well, I had to make a passing attempt at protecting my interests, didn't I? He asked like it was the most obvious thing in the world. What do you mean by that? How would killing the princess of the land of fire protect your interests? Naruto asked, being baffled at what he heard. It would keep her father on the throne longer, for one. He pointed out. Let's face it, the capital is one mistake short of having the daimyo overthrown and placing his daughter in charge. If she's dead, that'll be delayed for a while. That was when Kakashi made the connection. The fire daimyo is working with you, isn't he? He accused the Akatsuki member. He asked, he asked you to put the second hit on his daughter? Naruto demanded, also realizing what that meant. Who would ask to have their own daughter be killed? He silently asked. Are you forgetting the asshole? The QB asked in return. He was fairly mad after Zuko and Azula had left. That was a rhetorical question, Fox. You would both be wrong. Toby announced, getting their attention again. The fire daimyo does not work with us. We just pull his strings. He is used to that happening to him, considering his first wife had been doing it to him ever since they were married. How do you know about his first wife? Kakashi asked him, not liking where this was going. That's simple, we were the ones to have her killed. He answered with a straight face. Once she was dead, we moved in and took her spot. You depraved a girl of her mother when you did that. Irrelevant. He shrugged his shoulders. She was a nuisance and had to be removed. Once she was gone, we had control of the land of the fire. Naruto became confused. Something wasn't clicking in his mind. If you had control of the land of fire, you must have known about me being a Jinchuriki. Why didn't you demand the Hokage to hand me over? A daimyo demanding the Jinchuriki of the resident hidden village be handed over when he knows it has to stay in the village? That would have been too odd for anyone. He said, making it sound like he was explaining it to a child. I am not in it. He growled at the masked man. Again, irrelevant, he said, ignoring the growl. You did give us a bit of a surprise when you left the elemental countries, I'll admit. Thankfully, we had a way to correct that. Kaka Kakashi immediately understood what he meant by that. You let the investigation go through. He said aloud. You could have stopped it, and you didn't. Investigation? Asked Naruto. What investigation? The investigation of you, Naruto Uzumaki, Toby told him. You didn't know? Remarkable. What's he talking about, Hitaki? He demanded of Kakashi, looking straight at him. Allow me to explain. 
Toby said, stopping Kakashi from speaking. After you left, Tsunade had asked the daimyo to open an investigation on you when he got to the village. We allowed this to happen because we knew that everything the previous civilian council had done would come out into the open, giving her the chance to get rid of them. Then she had the Kanoha 11 look at your medical records, once they were done, she told them about what happened with the QB. Once they heard that, they looked for you everywhere in the elemental countries. Why waste resources and effort looking for me, when all you had to do was watch them? He muttered aloud. Exactly, you have improved in using your brain. He praised him while also subtly insulting him. Of course, we had occasionally sent a team to see if they had found anything, and to give the impression we were looking for you too. It gave them an incentive to keep looking for you whenever it looked like they were on the verge of giving up. It may have taken them three years to find you, but they did in the end. Wait. Kakashi interrupted. You said that you had to make a passing attempt at protecting your interests. Yes, I did say that. He conceded. Why would you only try a passing attempt? You have control of the fire daimyo, the land of fire is yours to command. You should have tried every everything to make sure it stayed like that, but you only made a passing attempt. Why? He asked, suspicious. Very observant, Kakashi Hataki, you certainly live up to your reputation. The Akatsuki member praised him. Yes, we would have tried harder to protect the fire daimyo from being overthrown, if he actually mattered in our plans. We have enough resources that the loss of a daimyo in his country does not matter, even if it is one of the five great shinobi countries. Truth be told, controlling him and controlling the land of fire was nothing more than amusement. You call playing with a ruler and his country amusement? Naruto demanded, outraged at the idea. He had spent enough time in Ba Sing Se watching Long Fong treat the place like his own personal toy to earn his hatred of anyone who did the same. Yes, I do. Watching those advisors scurry around and try to make sure that the damage was kept to a minimum was amusing at first. Now, it's become a little boring. I've been looking for an excuse to get rid of the daimyo for a while now, and you've managed to do it for me. Thanks for that. What do you mean? The fire daimyo is still alive. Kakashi protested. He turned his gaze over to him. The hole where his right eye should almost seem to bore straight through. Do you think I'm an idiot? I knew what your plan was the minute I had stepped into the dance hall and looked at the royal table, just like I knew what Naruto and his little team were doing when I saw his bounty hunter friend in the bar. I could have stopped your plans the second you all walked into the capital. Then why didn't you? He asked as both he and Naruto searched through their memories of the dance, trying to figure who Toby had been disguised as, despite knowing the fact it was a long shot. They still had to try. To let you think you had the advantage. But now, you know that you never had a chance. You've been dancing to my tune the entire time. You might as well hand over the QB's Jinchuriki now to save yourself the trouble of realizing it when it's too late. Naruto leapt off the wall so fast he caused a gust of wind in the spot he had been in. He landed in front of the Akatsuki member, grabbed hold of his throat and slammed him against the wall. There are three things you need to remember. He growled as he held the kunai close to the hole in the mask. 1. Don't talk about me like I'm not here. 2. I don't obey Kanoha anymore, telling them to hand me over would be pointless. And 3. Do you honestly think I would let you and your friends revive that thing willingly? He asked, saying the word thing like it was the stuff of nightmares. While Kakashi was confused, Toby actually chuckled. So, you know his origins. How did you find out? Like I would tell you that, he replied. What he had learned that night was something he wasn't likely to forget. Flashback. Night was in full bloom over the Fire Nation. Most people were fast asleep in their beds, dreaming of things they wouldn't really remember in the morning. The air was mostly quiet, save for the occasional crackle of a nearby, or the sounds of a guard as one of them walked by. If one looked up into the sky, they would see that the stars were out in full, along with the moon in all its glory. Naruto couldn't sleep, 
so he sat on the roof above Azula's bedroom, keeping watch over her while also stargazing. He found the practice to be somewhat relaxing, he had yet to find something that would rid him of his nightmares, and it allowed him to keep an eye on the princess. The moon's full. He noted, looking up at it. How observant of you, the QB sarcastically remarked. Next you'll be telling me that the stars are bright. What's got you in a mood? He asked the fox. He had recently noticed that whenever the moon was full, the bijou got incredibly grouchy. Nothing that concerns you, the fox replied. I just hate that damn thing. How can you hate the moon? It's just a big ball of rock floating around the planet that also helps waterbenders do their thing. Well, that big ball of rock and I go way back. When he heard that, he had to restrain himself from laughing out loud. What? You slept with one of the fishes or something? He asked with a grin. Where in the name of Kami did you get that idea? The fox asked him. That idea was so far-fetched and weird, you didn't really expect it to be said out loud. How else would you have a history with the moon? I can't think of anything else that would imply having a bad history with the moon, and that's considering the fact we're talking about you. He pointed out. And what's that supposed to mean? He asked, sounding offended. Out of the two of us, who was the one who kept giving a running commentary of women in boot camp who would probably be good in bed? The blonde asked pointedly. How many times do I have to tell you I was bored? There's only so much I could take of watching you doing laps, push-ups, or whatever it was you were doing. He defended himself. Besides, I have never met those spirits, I can't speak for the other bijou. Okay, now you've got me confused. How would you have a history with the moon without knowing the fishes? Especially since one of them is the moon spirit? He scoffed. Please, it's not that hard. Those two didn't realize that the old moon was destroyed and the new one had something inside it until about 500 years after the fact. Oh, I, I see. He said. He was about to turn his attention back to the sky when he computed what the QB had said. Wait a minute. What do you mean by the old moon was destroyed? What are you talking about? It's a long story, really long. You probably wouldn't be interested. Oh no, you are not going to try to wave this off. How the hell do you know that the moon has something inside in the first place? That's the kind of thing that needs an answer. So, start talking Fox. He ordered. You're not going to let this go, are you? The Bijou asked, hopeful he just might. Of course, I'm not, now start talking. Fine, I'll talk. He stifled a defeated sigh. What do you know about the Sage of the Six Paths? Only what they told me in the Academy. He was the first to discover the truth of Chakra and tried to use it to bring the world into an era of peace. He eventually created the Shinobi and was regarded as the Shinobi no Kami, God of Shinobi. He eventually had two sons, whose descendants would eventually become the Senju and Uchiha clan, respectively. He remembered that part well, considering the teachers kept going over the sons. Did you ever wonder how he got that title? He thought it over for a moment. Not really, no. I always figured he got it because he was the first actual shinobi. He knew the title had also been given to the Shodame Hokage and the Sandame Hokage, both legendary figures themselves, when he was younger, he had a hard time believing the fact that the Sandame held that title. There was a little more to it than that. He also created the Bijou. Wait, he what? He asked, surprised. I weep at the education you got. The fox told him in a deadpan tone. Shut up, that's not exactly general knowledge. So, you're saying that the sage created you guys himself? He just made nine creatures of chakra from scratch? You would be correct, from a certain point of view. He groaned quietly. Would you just give me a straight answer, QB? You're giving me a damn headache. He asked, using the whiny tone that the fox hated. All right, all right, just knock it off with that tone of voice. 
he told his Jinchuriki with a snarl. Look, the Sage of the Six Paths got most of his fame and his title from a single event, his victory over the Jubi. The Jubi? But I thought there were only nine of you. He protested. He had never heard of a tenth Biju, and that was enough to make him nervous. If you stopped interrupting me, perhaps I could explain? The fox asked pointedly. Look, entire armies had been sent up against the Jubi, and were completely annihilated within the span of a few minutes. Everyone lived in terror and fear as it rampaged around the world, until the sage fought it. And killed it? No, he didn't. He sealed the Jubi inside of himself and became its Jinchuriki. It allowed him to harness and control the overwhelming power of the Jubi. And so, he kept it inside himself for the rest of his life. That part he knew. If a Jinchuriki died, the Biju within them died as well. That's where you would be wrong. If the sage had died with the Jubi sealed within him, it would be free again and things would have gone back to square one. So he tried to find a way to prevent this from happening. Eventually he succeeded. How did he do that? He asked, curious. He used a jutsu called Banbutsa Sozo, creation of all things, to separate the chakra of the Jubi from the body. With the chakra, he used it to create nine beings and gave them life. Which would have been you and the other eight Biju, right? The blonde asked, saying the obvious. How very observant of you, he drilly remarked. Thank you so much for noticing. He replied in the same dry tone. Besides, if he took the chakra out of the jubi, what the hell did he do with the bo body? That's where the second moon comes in. The first moon had been accidentally destroyed during their battle, which put the moon spirit into a coma-like state and made waterbending half as strong. The sage used a jutsu called Chibaku Tensei, heavenly body bursting from the earth, to tear out an immense piece of the earth, placed the body deep within it, and then hurled into orbit. That's also why you humans have never found any evidence of the battle between them. He used the battleground to make the moon. How much of the earth did he use? Well, you know how there's a big ocean between the elemental countries and the bending countries? Yeah, I sailed on it. That used to be a continent. The fox told him with a completely straight face. It took Naruto a few minutes to get that computed. Okay, are you telling me the entire battleground between the Sage of the Six Paths and the Jubi was an entire freaking continent? He all but screamed. That's what the Sage told us. Oh, well that makes all the difference, doesn't it? He asked with agitated sarcasm. Then he heard what the QB had said. Wait, what the sage told you? You knew the guy? He raised us. We learned everything from him, including his fight against the Jubi. Hell, we thought of him like a father. He could still remember those days and he remembered them fondly. And whenever he talked about his fight against the Jubi, we could always hear the undercurrents of hatred and bitterness in his voice. So that's why you don't like the moon because it reminds you of something you once were and something your father figure hated. We always thought that if we became the Jubi again, we would be disappointing him. Besides, we could see where he was coming from. You mean you can remember everything about the Jubi? He asked. Not exactly, the fox admitted. I don't know about the others, but I could only see the memories of the Jubi in my dreams. Well, I say dreams, it was more like nightmares. All I saw was wanton destruction, death, complete and utter chaos and terror. He shuddered. I may be a creature who enjoys a little mayhem once in a while, but even I draw the line at trying to make the world I live in burn. Yeah, I guess I can understand why you would hate the moon if you saw that when you dream. He admitted. I'll be honest with you, QB, that's a lot of information to take in. I do have one question though. What's that? How in the bloody blue hell does one accidentally destroy a moon? He demanded. We actually asked him that once. He got embarrassed and mumbled something about one wrong jutsu at the wrong moment. Dot. When he heard that part, Naruto was very hard-pressed to not snigger or even laugh. It didn't sound right. 
A legendary, if not outright mythical, person who made out to be that he could do no wrong had accidentally destroyed something that wasn't even on the planet. It just sounded like the beginning of a bad joke. End flashback. Why the hell are you people trying to set it free? Naruto demanded, maintaining his grip on the Akatsuki member's throat. Do you honestly think you can control it? Why yes, we do. Toby answered nonchalantly, acting like nothing was wrong. Why else would we be set on it? Because you're all certified insane, that's why. He accused him. Do you not realize what will happen? This world would become hell on earth if it gets free. And that's where you would be quite mistaken. You see, we have no intention of letting it run wild. Then what are you planning? Kakashi asked. Even though he had no idea of what they were talking about, he decided to play along, pretending to know what Naruto knew and hoped it would be enough to get the Akatsuki's plan. It's quite simple. He told them. He then proceeded to walk through Naruto's grip and through Naruto himself, his body passing through like nothing was there, making Naruto lose his grip and begin to fall forward. Forward. He would have crashed to the ground, had he not used the wall to steady himself, stabbing the kunai into it. What we plan to do is use the jubi to create a reality without war or suffering, a reality in where no one dies. The masked man declared, looking up at the moon. And what would be the cost for that reality? Naruto demanded as he turned away from the wall, leaving the kunai embedded in it. He knew that there always would have to be a cost. We would simple take away the world's greatest weakness, free will. That simple statement stunned both the Kanoha Shinobi and Fire Nation Paragon. If you do that, then we would be nothing than slaves to a fake reality. Kakashi argued. That is infinitely better than this useless reality. Why would you want to live in a reality where everyone you've cherished will die? Where you speak to a monument or a grave, hoping for a small measure of peace? He asked the two of them. We do that so we can live in honor of those we've lost. Naruto told him. Even in death, they're still your comrades. If you don't remember who you've lost and cherish the memories you have of them, then you'll live alone. And that is the most painful way to live a life. I had hoped that you would have grown up since leaving Kanoha, Naruto. He gave disappointed sigh. I guess I was wrong, you're still as naive as the day you left. No, I'm not. I've lost friends, people I've fought aside or led myself. But have you ever lost someone you truly cared for? Someone you cherished above all else? A person who if they died would make you feel like life had no meaning left? No, I haven't. He finally admitted, after an image of Azula wearing a slight skull flashed through his mind. But still, if they had died, I wouldn't try to bring them back. What would be done would be done, there's no change changing that. And that's where you and I differ. Toby stated. You would still have faith in this reality, even if it had taken the one you cherished the most away from you. I would create a new reality where you wouldn't have to suffer such losses. Is that such a bad thing? When you take away free will and make us puppets, yes, it is. Kakashi told him. He turned to face the shinobi from Kanoha. You shouldn't open your mouth so easily, Kakashi. He warned him. As I recalled, you were the one who caused the Akatsuki's plan to proceed the way it has. For that, I thank you. He looked up at the sky again, as if he was checking something. I believe now would be the time for me to leave. Wait a minute, just who the hell are you? Naruto demanded. The fact that this masked man had allowed them to flounder around trying to stop the assassination from happening for the sake of amusement and also admitting to killing a mother just so they could rule from the shadows. That ticked him off to no end, but the kicker was the fact he let them go through with their plan just because he was bored with manipulating the fire daimyo. Ah, yes of course. You would want a name to go with this person. He took the same mocking thinking pose. What would you say if I told you that I was Madara Uchiha? I would say you're full of it. You forget I've got someone who personally knows Madara Uchiha. 
He could also verify that statement by soul bending, but that wasn't something he was going to say out loud. He chuckled, sending a shiver up both Naruto's and Kakashi's spine. In that case, you may continue to call me Toby. But in truth. He looked at both of them. For some reason they couldn't explain, the hole in his mask now showed an eye. But it wasn't an ordinary eye, it was a shar Sharingan. I don't want to be anyone in this reality, since nothing in it matters to me. He turned his gaze onto Naruto. I will see you again, Naruto Uzumaki, and I will make you see why your ideals are wrong. When that happens, you will gladly surrender yourself to us. It'll never happen, I promise you that. He growled. If you say so, he said. Until the next game. The space around the hole in the mask began to distort itself, swirling outward and began to suck in the surrounding air, almost like a black hole. Before either Naruto or Kakashi could stop him, Toby disappeared into the hole, which disappeared afterwards, leaving the two alone in a blocked-off alley. The two of them stood in silence for a couple of minutes. What is the jubi? Kakashi finally asked Naruto. And here I thought you knew. He replied. You're a jonin, you figured it out. The more important question is how the hell do you know that man? I don't. Why do I have a hard time believing you? He demanded. You heard him just as well as I did. And apparently, you're the one who started all this crap. So who was he? I told you, I don't know. The masked shinobi defended himself. Then start thinking, Hataki. That guy had us on a silver platter the entire time we were here. He seems to know everything about us, and we don't a damn thing about him, except for the fact that he has a Sharingan for a right eye. Naruto. Naruto, it doesn't help us if we argue with each other. We do that, the Akatsuki gets the advantage over us. Let's get back to the others and tell them what we know, all right? He offered. He knew that Kakashi had a point, but he was still annoyed by the fact he had been led around by the nose by Toby. Fine, let's go. He marched out of the alley, shoving past Kakashi as he came back onto the street. Kakashi didn't say anything, he just stared at the empty space where Toby had stood. Who was he? He asked himself. Why did he make it sound like he knew me once? He shook his head, realizing that it wasn't the time to think about it. What was more important was to get back to the others and pass the information on. He turned around and walked away as well, tossing a kunai at the wall without looking. Wrapped around the hilt of the kunai was an explosive tag. Five seconds later, it detonated, causing a small concentrated blast that destroyed the wall. The next morning, all that would be left would be some rubble rubble, and a little scarring, nothing people would be a lot of attention to. Location, Teen Paragon. They were all waiting in one of the gardens in the palace, a few were quietly watching the fish swim around in a nearby pond. It had been a day since the dance. They had left the hotel they had been staying at and quickly moved into the palace, staying out of the way for the time. Things were already hectic enough without them adding fuel to the fire. But that wasn't the only reason for their silence. After Naruto and Kakashi had returned and told them what Toby told them of his own free will, they shared Naruto's annoyance. For most of the team, the plain fact that the Akatsuki had played them for fools with ease pissed them off. Saka and Azula were especially irritated, they had been kicking themselves for not catching on. What were the odds of June talking to the same guy who was also working for the Akatsuki in disguise? What were the odds that the person they would be working and the one who actually be doing the killing had a very bad grudge against the target? Those weren't even odds to begin with, they had been planned right from the start. You should have seen that, idiot. Saka mentally yelled at himself. He stared sullenly at a nearby wall like he was considering how to exactly hack it to pieces with his Zampakoto. Akela sat on his haunches nearby, patiently waiting. He knew that the mood Saka was in would only be temporarily. Jun had also noticed his mood. Saka, lighten up. She told him as she leaned against Nyla's flank, the garden was big enough to hold the Shursha comfortably, 
as there was an entrance to outside the palace nearby. So, we got duped. You can't let that get you down. You win some, and you lose some. That's all there is to it. This is coming from the best bounty hunter in the business? Azula asked with irritation evident in her voice. She, shr she shrugged. Hey, even I made mistakes starting out. But I don't beat myself up over the fact I lost a couple of bounties. You let that a couple of mistakes get to you, you'll be making a lot more. Trust me, I speak from experience. It's not that I'm angry about making a mistake. Saka said, turning away from the wall and looking at her. I'm angry that I was played. I'm supposed to be the idea guy and I had no idea about what was really going on. But this isn't the first time you were deceived, right? She asked him. You were deceived twice before. Those don't count. He objected. Naruto did the deceiving and he's on our side now. Just because he's on our side now doesn't mean those don't disappear. She pointed out. She's right, Saka. Naruto agreed, turning his attention away from the pond and to the rest of the group. I led you on twice, that isn't going to go away. Neither is the fact that Toby knew what we were doing from the start and let us do it. You don't sound too mad about that. Azula noted. She was still a little ticked off, but could see the reason in what Jun and Naruto said. Oh, trust me. I'm just as annoyed as you guys. But instead of getting angry, it makes me motivated to beat this guy. You're using this as an example of lesson number nine? She asked, getting confused looks from the others. Saka and Suki had heard the two of them talk about these lessons before in passing, and Azula had inadvertently told the Kyoshi warrior what the eighth lesson was during the Chunin exam. But they hadn't heard the other lessons or what they meant. Ah, I am taking it as an example. He answered. I'm also taking it as an example of lesson number one. Good point. She conceded, getting more confused looks from the others there. What are you two talking about? Suki finally dared asked. Could one of you please explain those lessons you keep going on about? Before either Naruto or Azula could answer, Jiraiya came into the garden from, from another entrance. What's up, FS Sensei? Saka asked the Toad Sage. My suspicions were right. He announced, not bothering to tell Saka to stop calling him that. He had told them earlier about his suspicions on the aliases they had been using during the dance. Those documents you sent me were legit. Not a single one of them was faked. We actually were using the identities of real people? What happened to them? Suki asked. After hearing the Akatsuki had no problem murdering Miki's mother, she knew that there had to be more victims. Surprisingly, they're still alive. From what I could learn, it seems that each and every one of the people you impersonated had been helped by the Akatsuki. Five years ago, Mancho had actually suffered a drought and his crops had suffered. His lands were on the verge of starvation until the Akatsuki sent Kisame Hashigaki to help him fix his problem. Gayu and her sister had been abused by both their father and mother until she was 18. The only reason it had stopped was because the Akatsuki had sent both Sasori and Orochimaru to kill the parents, allowing Gaia to inherit everything. Yon was indeed Jaicha's bodyguard since the both of them were ten. As they got older, they fell in love with each other, something Jaicha's father disapproved of. He would have had Yon killed had Itachi and Zetsu not managed to get them away. Nowadays, they're living happily together. Kikin was a man who was struggling to make ends meet and was in a good amount of debt. That night he went into the casino, his playing partner was an Akatsuki member called Kakuzu. How did the Akatsuki know about each of them? The fact each one of these people were in trouble and the Akatsuki came to the rescue doesn't seem like coincidence to me. June pointed out. It wasn't. Either they had contacted the Akatsuki themselves, or a friend had told them about the group. There's just one thing that connects all these th things. The Akatsuki didn't take money as payment for those jobs. 
Instead, they asked for the client's entire history, their past, hobbies, everything and anything about them. They were also told to deny any rumors they heard of them doing something that sounded out of character. How far back does this go? Azula asked, being astounded at what she heard. Gaio happened when Orochimaru was still in the Akatsuki, which is the oldest one in this group, and what happened to Kikin occurred about four months ago, which is the youngest. So, the Akatsuki didn't just force people to give up their identities once they planned to assassinate Koyuki. They've been doing this for years. Suki stated. Which means either one of two things, either they've been planning this assassination for a long time, or they have aliases created for the long term. Naruto realized. If a member of Akatsuki were to use one of these aliases to cause a scandal or kill someone, the real person would have a solid alibi, making any case the civilian or shinobi police try to open go cold. Thereby protecting both the Akatsuki member and the actual person, Saka finished, realizing where Naruto was going. That depends on what you define as an Akatsuki member. Nadar had told us that his killing of Koyuki was supposed to be his initiation mission, and if he succeeded, he would have become one of their members. The Akatsuki has only had 10 members at a time, all of which were S-class missing Nin. Jiraiya pointed out. They all thought over the information they knew, making the garden silent except for the pond and the fish inside its waters. What if the Akatsuki had unofficial members? Suki offered, getting everyone's attention. What do you mean by that, Suki? Jun asked. I mean, mean, like Akatsuki had members who worked for them but weren't infamous. That way, they could work without being noticed. That's plausible. Jiraiya agreed, thinking it over. It would also explain how they've managed to stay quiet until recently, but still complete missions. If that is the case, then what's with this initiation mission Nadar was talking about? Saka asked. If the Akatsuki members only have 10 members, then the unofficial members would stay where they are. What if the initiation mission is the unofficial member's chance to become an official member? Azula suggested. They successfully complete the mission and they become one of the 10. But those 10 are always S-class. Jiraiya pointed out to her. I highly doubt they would allow an unofficial member who wasn't an S-class shinobi become an actual member. I looked over Nadar's file, he was only a B-class shinobi. Perhaps the Akatsuki has influence over the bingo books? If they did, they could easily have his rank be upgraded to S-class. Naruto said. If they did have influence over the bingo books, then they would have to have agents in every single country that issues a bingo book. That thought made everyone there nervous. Each and every one of them had the same thought. Just how big is the Akatsuki? If what they had speculated was true, then the organization would be much, much larger than originally believed. Everyone, look, Jiraiya said to the others, bringing their attention away from their thoughts. A lot of this stuff is pure speculative. For all we know, we could be wrong. They all knew he was trying to reassure them, but it didn't really help. The fact that the Akatsuki was possibly bigger than just 10 members was enough to make any sane person nervous. Still, it was the thought that counted. He's right. June agreed. Unless we've got evidence to support all this, there's nothing to prove. So, let's relax. Speaking of re relaxing, we might as well get ready. Saka said. It's going to start soon. That's a good idea. Jiraiya conceded. Speaking of which, could you guys keep an eye on her until it starts? After they all nodded, he walked back over to the entrance he came through and signaled to someone on the other side, who soon came in through the entrance. How are you doing, Lady Koyoki? Naruto asked the daimyo of spring. I'm fine, Naruto. She told him with a smile. But I wish you would stop being so formal. Sorry, ma'am, have to stay professional. He told her before breaking out a grin. But it is good to see you made it through. Same here, she agreed. The official story was that the wounds she had suffered during the dance were surprisingly non-fatal, 
and she was able to recover. However, the fire daimyo had accidentally choked to death during the mass confusion and nobody noticed until it had been too late, leaving his daughter to take the throne. But as a very wise man once said, only an idiot believes the official story. The actual story was something quite different. It was the kind of story that was more at home in a book than real life, and it all started after the negotiation meeting between the spring daimyo and the advisors of the fire daimyo. Flashback The team Kakashi and Jiraiya had just finished going over positions in the dance hall that would successfully stop the assassination attempt, if everything went as the letter described. But considering that meant it was very likely things would change, it also meant that they had no chance of knowing if the positions would remain good or not. That left them with trying to figure out a plan of adaption if things went south. Ironically, it was Koyuki who came up with the idea. Lord Jiraiya, may I suggest something? She asked the Toad Sage. What's on your mind? He asked in return. Is it possible to use this assassination attempt to our advantage? That got everyone's attention. What are you thinking of, Koyuki? He asked her, his tone suspicious. She was quiet for a minute, unsure of how to answer. Finally, she looked him straight in the eye. Could we not use this assassination to get rid of the fire daimyo? It was a grand total of five minutes before anyone said anything else. Kakashi was the first to break the silence. Do you what you're saying, Lady Koyuki? He asked her. Yes, I do. She confirmed. You've all seen how the daimyo acted during the meeting. If he's been like that ever since he came to power, then he has to go. Were you planning to take his place once he's dead? Sai asked. If she was, Danzo would want to know ASAP. No, of course not, I have enough trouble running one country. I don't want her need to run another one. She told him, frowning. Then would you be suggesting that Mickey should take the throne? Sasuke asked. Is she even ready? Oh yeah, she's ready. Jiraiya confirmed. She's took lessons by watching her mother basically ran the country, and she also had to watch how her father rules now. I think it's safe to say that if the fire daimyo dies, she wouldn't shed too many tears over him. We would be plotting treason if we went through with this. Sakura pointed out. It's only treason if we get caught. He replied with a shrug of his shoulders. He turned his gaze back to the daimyo in the room. So, what did you have in mind? A few hours before the dance, the fire daimyo was alone in his room, writing a few letters before leaving for the dance. His concentration was interrupted when there was a knock on the door. Yes? Who's there? He called out, looking up from his desk. It's Jiraiya, my lord. The toad sage's voice spoke from the other side of the door. There's something we need to discuss. It's about where we will be positioned during the dance. May I come in? Yes. Yes. He stood up from his chair. Please give me a moment, I locked the door. He walked over to the door, unlocked it and opened it. Before he said anything, his eyes rolled backwards and he collapsed. The last thing he had seen was a spinning Sharingan. All right people, let's get this going. Jiraiya told the others standing in the hallway as he held the door open. Kakashi, please make sure the daimyo doesn't hit the ground. The face mask wearing shinobi quickly caught the falling daimyo. Got him, he quietly announced as he quickly walked into the room, using his free hand to cover the Sharingan with his headband. Sasuke and Koyuki followed him while Jiraiya closed the door. Sai and Sakura stayed outside to keep an eye out on the hallway. Lady Koyuki, please sit on the edge of the bed. Sasuke told her. She nodded and quickly sat down next to the unconscious fire daimyo, who had been positioned in a sitting pose. Are you sure about this? He asked her. If she wanted to back out of this, all they had to do was leave the room. The unconscious fire daimyo would wake up before the dance and no one would be the wiser. Yes, I'm sure. She answered with conviction. Then let us begin. 
Jiraiya declared. He focused his chakra onto the tip of his forefingers and pressed them on a spot on both of the daimyo's backs. Just underneath that spot was one of the tenketsu, chakra points, and when he injected his chakra into it, it would be enough to have the two civilians' chakra to briefly activate, giving them the power to use jutsu for a short amount of time. Kakashi, wake him up. He ordered, pulling his forefingers away. Kakashi nodded and proceeded to slap the fire daimyo across the face. He woke up with a jerk, but went still as he gazed into Kakashi's Sharingan. Next to him, Koyoki was in the same situation with Sasuke. The two shinobi formed a hand seal, and the two civilians did the same. While all four of them were doing the motions, Sasuke and Kakashi were manipulating manipulating the daimyo's chakra to activate the Henj no Jutsu, along with keeping the image of the target in mind. Henj no Jutsu, the four chorus together. The two daimyos were engulfed in plumes of smoke, and when the plumes dissipated, they had switched places, Koyuki now sat where the fire daimyo sat and vice versa. Everything set? Jiraiya asked both Kakashi and Sasuke. Kakashi nodded as he once again covered his Sharingan with his headband. They now think they're the other person and will act accordingly until we break the hypnosis. So, with any luck, Nadar will fall for it and attack the fire daimyo. Sasuke finished as he deactivated his Sharingan. Now all we have to do is pass the information to Naruto and his team. Are you kidding? That's the easy part. Jiraiya stated. He looked at the fire daimyo, Koyuki. Thank you for your time, my lord. We'll be leaving now. He said formally. Once the daimyo had nodded vaguely, Jiraiya, Sasuke, Kakashi, and Koyuki, the fire daimyo, turned and left the room. Jiraiya quick noticed Naruto walking into the hall and signaled him to come over. He acknowledged and casually made his way over to the toad sage. What is it? He whispered as he watched the rest of the people either dance or talk. There was a respectable distance between the two, close enough to hear each other, but not close enough to make look like they were talking to each other. Small change of plans, don't try to stop the assassination. Jiraiya answered. We switched Koyuki and the fire daimyo. He could see where this was going. All right, you'd better inform the others then. Kakashi is taking care of that. Naruto walked away into the crowd. He was soon besieged by a lot of teenaged girls. Azula, Azula pulled out the piece of paper that Kakashi had slipped into her breast pocket. It simply read. Don't stop assassination. Koyuki and Fire Daimyo are switched. She passed it to the next person beside her after reading it. The process repeated itself as each one took a moment to briefly read the note before handing it to the next person. Once they were done, Suki handed the paper back to Azula. She closed her hand around it and burned it to ashes with a quick fire bending. End flashback. And so, the fire daimyo was dead, long live the fire daimyo. They all stood in the throne room of the fire daimyo. Like the dance hall, it was very well done. High walls and columns supported a roof of rare dark wood, the same as the walls. The columns were made of a gray stone that had nothing on craved on them. The walls also had nothing on them, there were no paintings, banners, or tapestries. The whole room was rather plain, but that didn't ruin it. In fact, it emphasized it. It all conveyed a simple fact that this was a place for business, not fun. If one had to define the room, the word simple elegance would be the first choice. Everyone who needed to be in the throne room was there, lining the carpet that ran from the throne to the door. Naruto and his team stood closet to the throne. They had gotten rid of their disguise and Sokka and Suki decided to dress a bit more formally than the others, Sokka in his armor, minus the face paint, and Suki in hers, plus the face paint. Jun, Azula, and Naruto however were content to be back in their regular clothes. Akela and Nyla had stayed in the garden, due to the fact that they would make quite a few people in the room nervous. Despite of the difference in what they wore, all four paragons wore their medallions out in the open for everyone to see. 
the door opened and everyone turned their attention to it. Mickey came through, dressed in a black formal kimono. Even though she was technically supposed to be in mourning for her father, everyone knew for a fact that she wasn't. The only thing she had said when they told him of his death was it was bound to happen. Now, she made her way towards the throne that he had sat in. Behind was Team Kakashi, acting as guards. Jiraiya walked beside her, because the coronation ceremony was on short notice, there was no time for Tsunade to get to the capital, though she had been informed. As such, he was acting in her stead. They walked down the carpet, the sound of their footsteps muffled by the carpet. As they finally approached the throne, the senior advisor stepped in front of them. Who are you to approach the throne of the fire daimyo? He asked aloud, even though he knew her answer, formalities had to be observed. She stepped forward, away from Jiraiya and Team Kakashi. I am Miki, daughter of Hideaki, daimyo of the land of fire. I have come to claim my right as his heir. She answered, slowly and formally. Who supports her claim? He asked, looking at the hall. I do. Jiraiya answered, stepping forward. And who are you? I am Jiraiya of the Sanin, Toad Sage of M.T. Maya Boku. I stand in the stead of Tsunade Senju, the Godame Hokage, and as such, we both support Princess Miki's claim to the throne. Does anyone else support her claim? He asked again. I do. Sasuke answered, stepping forward and standing next to Jiraiya. And you are? The advisor asked. I am Sasuke Uchiha, the Kurajishi no Sharingan, son of the Uchiha clan and their heir, Jonin of Kanahegakur. I stand here and declare my support for Princess Miki's claim to the throne, as does the Uchiha clan itself. He declared. The way he made the statement and the way he looked as he spoke, Naruto wasn't surprised when he noticed the love-struck looks the girls in the hall were throwing at his back. Of course, he would get all that. He thought to himself. Feeling jealous, are we? The QB asked with a smirk. No, I am not. He protested. If anything, I'm glad that he's getting it and I'm not. not. You are jealous. I knew it. The fox declared triumphantly. Does anyone else support her claim? The advisor asked for the third time. Silence filled the hall, no one was expecting anyone to answer the question. Mickey already had the backing of the Toad Sage, and by extension, the Hokage, as well as the clan heir of the Uchiha. She didn't really need anyone else. However, nobody told Naruto that. Oh fuck it. I might as well. He thought to himself before stepping forward, deciding to indulge in a little vanity. I do. He announced, getting the attention of everyone in the hall, his teammates included. Uh, who exactly are you? The advisor asked as he looked at the stranger who stood next to Mickey, a little uncertain on what was going on. He hadn't been informed about this blonde-haired man declaring his support for Mickey, so he decided to go with formality. I am Naruto Uzumaki, child of the lost Uzumaki clan, and son of the Yandame Hokage, paragon of the Fire Nation, bodyguard to Princess Azula, sister to Fire Lord Zuko. I am the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi and Princess Miki has my support for her claim. He stated with complete confidence, no hesitation, and no fear. His eyes dared the advisor to say something in response. If he had looked back behind him, he would have noticed the girls were now giving him the love-struck looks. He also would have seen Azula giving all of the said girls death glares. The fact that he had so brazenly announced who he was stunned the entire audience, minus the love-struck girls who were being glared to death. It wasn't exactly common knowledge that the Yandame Hokage was his father and the fact he had just stated it out loud, along with the fact he said he was in what sounded like a high position as well as being the guard to royalty got the attention of quite a few people there. His status of being a Jinchuriki made a couple of people nervous, but the majority of the people there just ignored it for the other titles he had. The senior advisor regained his composure and turned his gaze to Mickey. Do you accept these claims? He asked her. I do. 
She answered. Do you accept the burden of which you ask for? I do. Are you willing to stand for this land, through good and bad? I am. Then kneel. He commanded. She knelt down onto one knee and bowed her head. Another advisor came forward and handed him the headdress of the fire daimyo. He took it, holding it in both hands, and placed it atop her head. Stand and take your seat, milady. He told her, taking his hands away. Jiraiya, Sasuke, and Naruto stepped back away from her, joining the front of the crowd along with Team Kakashi. She rose and walked towards the throne, a simple chair made of wood. She walked up the three steps and sat on the throne of the fire daimyo. Once she had sat down, everyone in the hall knelt down. Hail Lady Miki, daimyo of the land of fire. They chorused as one, their combined voice rang through the room and reverberated against the walls. Thank you. She said with a smile as they stood again. I know a lot of you were waiting for the day I took the throne. That day is here, and I promise to make sure that your patience will not be wasted. But there are things that need to be done. The smile disappeared as her expression became neutral. Madam Sir Jimmy, come forward. The stepmother of the new daimyo stepped out of the crowd and walked up to the throne. It was obvious by the pleased look on her face and the smug smile she wore that she was expecting a reward. She stood in front of the throne, not bothering to kneel to her stepdaughter. Madam Sir Jimmy, ever since my mother died, you became my father's new wife. Wife. You've lived with me and yet, you placed a greater importance on your cat than me. You only saw me as someone to play dress or someone that had to be married right away. So, I give you my first command as daimyo. The smile on Shijini's face, despite the things said about her, couldn't have been smugger. Leave. What? Sure Jimmy asked as the grin she had on became uncertain. Get out. I'm afraid I misunderstood you, Mickey, could you please? You will address me as Lady Daimyo. She unexpectedly thundered, making most of the people there flinch and take a small step back, the shinobi, as well as Team Paragon, didn't budge. And you misunderstood nothing. You are to get out, to leave, to never been seen in my sight again. As of this moment, I strip you of all titles and powers that are related to the status of the daimyo's wife. Now get out of my sight before I strip you of all your titles and powers and also give your kami damned cat to Kanoha. The five shinobi and one ex-shinobi were quickly filled with hope. My lady, please give us the cat. Jiraiya practically begged her. I know many genin, both former and current, who would just love the opportunity to kill that cat. Just give us the word and they'll be on the creature like a pack of dogs. Actually, the genin from the Inazuka clan would be on it like pack of dogs. He noted. That was enough to get Sir Jimmy bolting out of the hall, screaming for her precious Torah. As she left, everyone was wearing some sort of smile, because that was one hell of a way to get rid of the stepmother you detested. Now that the fat bitch has been taken care of. Mickey said, earning a couple of chuckles from the crowd. Naruto Uzumaki, come forward. The hall fell silent as he took a few steps forward, stopping at the base of the first step. It is thanks to your warning of the assassination that I was able to have an excuse to walk away from the dance hall. All I did was dance with you, milady. He replied modestly. You came up with the excuse yourself. True, although I was a little disappointed when you come to my room. She told him with a smile that would have made lesser men go weak at the knees, which would have been evident in the crowd, if you knew where to look. I was interested to see what kind of moves you had at your disposal. I'm sorry, Lady Mickey. But I have a girlfriend. Could have brought her, she told him with a shrug of her shoulders. Once again, jaws were being picked up from the floor when the crowd heard that. That's not my decision, ma'am. He replied, struggling to make sure he didn't blush, it was getting difficult. You'd have to take that up with my girlfriend. It's not a bad idea if you think about it. Azula spoke up, getting everyone's attention. Actually, it sounds like it could be both interesting and entertaining. 
The jaws that were in the process of being picked up fell to the floor again. They could believe what they had just heard. His girlfriend had just given him permission to have a threesome with her and the new fire daimyo. Several of the young men there were cursing Naruto's luck. To them, only an idiot would pass this kind of chance. But unbeknownst to them, Naruto was that kind of idiot. I'd still pass, milady. He said to Mickey. I think the three of us would agree that the next morning would be a little awkward. Besides, it wouldn't feel right to me. That simple statement endeared him to many of the women there. Are you fucking crazy? Someone from the back of the crowd yelled out at him. Nobody battered an eyelash and kept facing forward, although there were sounds of someone hushing the person. Well, it's a pity, but I won't push you. Mickey told him, which made him take a silent breath of relief. Back to the matter at hand, I want to reward you for saving both my life and capturing the assassin. The senior advisor reached into a pocket and pulled out a folded piece of cloth. Unfolding it, he revealed it to be a sash that had the symbol of fire on it. I ask you, Naruto Uzumaki, to become one of the twelve guardian shinobi. I also offer you the position of being my personal guard. The crowd was surprised to hear that second part. To be asked to join the twelve guardian shinobi was one thing, but to be asked to be her personal guard was another thing. If he accepted, odds are he would have become one of the most powerful people in the land of fire, second only to her. Practically everyone there, with a few exceptions, expected him to accept the offers. However, he disappointed them once again. I'm afraid I will have to decline your offers, Lady Mickey, considering I already have a similar job protecting the Fire Lord's sister. He told her. Is there any chance I could persuade her to give you to me? Again, you'll have to take that up with her. When he said that, Azula walked up and stood right by his side, looking up at the daimyo. I said it might be interesting to share him. She told her, looking her straight in the eye. I never agree to letting you have him to yourself, and I never will. There was an indirect challenge in the sentence. It was as if Azula was trying to make Mickey challenge her for him. But she didn't rise to it. Very well, I will not try to push you into something you do not want to do. She gestured to the advisor to put the sash away. But I still feel like I should reward you. That isn't necessary, milady. Naruto told her. I do not need any reward. And I feel that you do. At the very least, let me give you a title so people will remember your name. I already have a title, ma'am. I am the paragon of the Fire Nation. He tapped the medallion hanging from his neck. Her face took a thoughtful expression when she heard that. Just what is a paragon? I've heard that the people in the bending countries could control the very elements themselves, without the need for chakra or hand seals. Does being a paragon mean that you are the most powerful wielder of that particular element? He gave a brief laugh. No, it doesn't mean that. Besides, I'm not a bender. You're born with that. All four paragons, including myself, are non-benders. He gestured towards Suki, Jun, and Saka. But what is a paragon? She asked again, being genuinely curious about them. Naruto didn't say anything. He just turned and looked at Jun. Being the eldest paragon among them, she was probably the best at describing what they are. She met his gaze and nodded in agreement, before looking up at the daimyo. To be a paragon is to serve your country, completely and utterly. You embody that country and do that, you must be the best. The reason that only non-benders can become paragons is because we push ourselves to the very edge of our limits and break those limits to be known as the best. She explained. I see. The daimyo was silent for a moment before turning to look at Naruto. If I remember correctly, you used the name Kikin during the dance. She told him. Yes, yes, milady, but I think whoever was trying to have you and Lady Koyuki assassinated was trying to be funny. He replied. It was a little more obvious now that he thought about it. Kanoha had found about him around the beginning of spring, and the actual Kikin became a rich man only four months ago. 
What are the odds of those being a coincidence? He asked himself. Those are no odds. It was deliberate. The QB told him. You make it sound like I hadn't figured that out myself. He replied with heavy sarcasm. Naruto Uzumaki, when I had found out that it was you who managed to save me, and that you were a former Kanoha Shinobi, I was curious. Mickey said aloud. So I read up on you. You have quite the impressive track record, despite it being short. You kept pushing yourself to be the best every time you came up against that tried to stop. You are an amazing shinobi, and if what your fellow paragon said is true, then you are most definitely worthy being one. So I, Mickey, Daimyo of the Land of Fire, hereby name you the Shinobi Kicken, Shinobi Paragon. Let the countries know you as such. He could only bow his head to her. Thank you, milady, I can only hope that I do the title you gave me justice. I'm sure that you will. She assured him with a smile. You may go. He back away and Azula followed, joining their friends in the crowd. And now, the people will see their new daimyo. She declared, standing up from the throne. She walked down the steps and onto the carpet, making her towards the door, where she would go through and walk onto a nearby balcony so she could greet her subjects. They gathered near the gates of the city. Once Mickey had stepped out onto the balcony and the people saw, there was a great amount of cheering. To them, she was the hope that they had waiting patiently for during her father's rule, the hope that she would be a better ruler than he had been. Mickey had accepted the cheering humbly, she bowed her head in, in thanks while also smiling and waving. Once that was done, she got down to business. Within two hours the trade agreement between the Land of Fire and the Land of Spring, which had been hashed out and haggled over long before Koyuki had arrived, was signed. Koyuki would stay in the capital to help Mickey get used to being daimyo, where she would be surrounded by guards 24-7 even though the shinobi knew it wasn't likely for another assassination attempt to happen. Is everyone ready? Jiraiya asked the others. Due to the fact that Saka, Suki, Jun, and Azula couldn't run through the trees, as well as having Akela and Nyla, they would have to stick to the road. They could go a little faster, perhaps shave off a day or two, but it was still slower than he'd liked. Yeah, we're ready. Jun told him as she stood next to Nyla. As she double-checked everything she had, Sasuke walked up to the other side of the Shershu and began whispering in his ear. All right, then let's get he was interrupted when Nyla began to growl loudly at Naruto, getting everyone's attention. It looked the Shershu was very angry at him for some reason. What's the matter with you ugly? Naruto asked him, only to hit the ground when he shot his tongue at him, letting fly over. Whoa. Will you be careful? Now's not the time for he didn't finish the sentence due to the fact Nyla kept shooting his tongue out at him, forcing him to roll around on the ground. In the end, he took off down the road with the Shershu in pursuit. The others could only look on as this happened. What in the, in the name of you was that all about? Saka asked. Sasuke couldn't take it anymore. He started to laugh out loud. Both Team Kakashi and Jiraiya looked at him in surprise. Sure, he smiled more than before Naruto left, he could chuckle at a joke, even crack one himself with a completely straight face. But they had never actually heard him laugh. To her surprise, Sakura found it pleasant. She couldn't help but laugh along with him. What did you do? Jun asked him, turning around to face him. I might have told your Shursha that Naruto said a couple of unpleasant things when he wasn't around. I'm surprised it actually worked. Considering the way those two fought on the way here, I had thought it would take a bit more to get a rise out of him. He told her as he tried to stop laughing. She couldn't help but agree. Naruto had been insulting Nyla for so long, she had also thought it would be a little difficult to get the Shershu angry. Perhaps we should go after them before the creature tries to eat him? Sai pointed out. The rest of them agree with what he said and began to run after Naruto and Nyla. Sasuke's and Sakura's laughter had dwindled down to sniggers. While the others could find the situation a little funny, they were more focused on either getting home or making sure Nyla didn't kill Naruto. 
What an idiot! Azula thought to herself as they ran, looking over at Sasuke. He never should have done that. Location, Kanoha. They stood in Tsunade's office, delivering their report to her, while Akela and Nyla waited outside of the building. It had taken them about three and a half days to get back, the half day was due to chasing after Naruto and Nyla, whom they found collapsed on the ground against each other, exhausted. Is that everything? She asked Jiraiya. So far as we know, but a lot of this is pure speculation. He replied. That may be, be, but if a single bit is true, then we're in a lot more trouble than we originally thought. She pointed out as she leaned back in her chair. There is one way to confirm some of it. Naruto said, getting their attention. We could pump Kabuto for information. He served under Orochimaru, and that bastard was a former member of the Akatsuki. He's bound to know more than what's written down. He saw the uneasy looks on Tsunade's, Jiraiya's, and Kakashi's faces and covered his face with his hand, pinching the bridge of his nose. What happened? Two days after you, your team, and Jiraiya went back to the bending countries, Kabuto broke out of the cell we were holding him in. Tsunade told him. He killed about half of the guards who tried to stop him. Once he got out of the building and onto the street, we lost him. From the tracking reports from both the Inazuka clan and the Hyuga clan, we believe that he was out of the village within an hour. And now you have no idea where he is. Saka summarized, stifling a groan. This is going to come back and bite us in the blubber, I just know it. Well it's not going to happen right now. June told him, leaning against the wall. We should just focus on the main problem right now. She's right. We need to focus on the Akatsuki, not Kabuto. Sakura agreed with her. They all knew the two were right. The Akatsuki was the more pressing issue. But they couldn't deny that if Kabuto ever showed himself again, there was bound to be trouble. Regardless, both teams Kakashi and Paragon have done well. Tsunade told them. Even I cannot deny the fact that it's a relief to see Miki on the throne. You've obtained the information that was needed and possibly more if we can get it confirmed. You are dismissed. The two teams turned around and walked out of the office while Jiraiya and Kakashi stayed behind. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to see if I can find a place to train. Saka said as he closed the door behind him. Sai just walked off without saying a word to the others. He had to report to Danzo. You want some company? Suki asked with a smirk. I could toss your rear to the ground again. The pleasure would be mine, Suki. Although, I'm sure that I'll be doing the same to you. He replied with a grin. You're welcome to try. She challenged. The two walked off together, eager to get in some sparring time. I gotta make sure Nyla hasn't attacked anyone. June told them as she walked down the hallway away from them leaving Naruto and Azula alone with Sasuke and Sakura. The situation would have been awkward if Naruto didn't turn around and walk away. Where are you going, Naruto? Sakura asked. Both she and Sasuke had been hoping he would stay a while, so they could actually have a conversation. I'm going to see someone. He answered curtly, not bothering to turn and face them. Don't bother asking me who it is, it's not your business. I'll see you back at the house then, Naruto? Azula asked him, not bothered by the fact he was leaving her alone. Yeah, you have a good night, Azula. You too, and try not to get into trouble, okay? He stopped and looked at her with a grin on his face. No promises. He told her. He turned back around and kept walking, soon disappearing from their sight. Location, Academy. He stood in front of a classroom door, unexpectedly nervous. A small part of his mind urged him to forget this idea, to just keep on walking. Are you going to go in or not? The QB asked in a bored tone. I'm a little nervous here, okay? I haven't seen him in three years. He told the fox. There was a part of him that wanted to turn around and walk away from the door. 
And now, you're standing outside the door to his classroom. Would you just open, open it already? It's boring just watching you stand there. Well pardon me for boring you. He retorted. He took a deep breath, opened the door, and saw Irika Yumino sitting at the teacher's desk, looking through papers. The sight gave him a nostalgic grin. It's well after school hours and you're still here, grading tests. He said aloud, getting Irika's attention. Do you not have a life, Irika-sensei? Naruto? He asked in surprise, standing up from his chair. In the flesh, Irika-sensei, how have you been? He asked in return. Irika didn't answer, he just walked over to him and gave him a hug so tight, he difficulty time breathing. Irika-sensei, I need air for continued existence. He managed to choke out. I should let you suffocate. Irika growled out, but he released him anyway, letting him breath. You were in the village a whole month before the final exam. A month. And you don't bother to come and see me once. In my defense, I was a little busy during that time. He protested as he got the rest of his breathing ability back. I was going to fight Orochimaru, so Jiraiya was training my ass off. In any case, it's good to see you again, Naruto. His old teacher said with a smile. You too, Irika sensei he replied with a grin. You sure have grown. He noted as he looked over his former student. I'm finding it hard to believe that you used to be the shortest in the class. Now look at you, whatever you ate in the past three years has definitely agreed with you. That and a lot of working out, I went from being in one military force to another in the span of a few weeks. He winced slightly. That was an entirely different experience from the classroom. Did it do you any good? Of course, it did. He was a little offended at Irika suggesting that it wasn't worth it. Then why, why are you complaining? I'm not. I could even beat you now, Irika sensei He said with a scowl on his face. He laughed. Of that, I have no doubt. The scowl on Naruto's face lasted for about two seconds before he joined in the laughter. So, tell me, did you find any good ramen over there? Irika asked him after they had stopped laughing. No, there wasn't any over in the bending countries. Besides it was no big deal. He replied with a shrug of his shoulders. I haven't had ramen in three years. You mean to tell me you haven't been to a Chiraco ramen ever since you got back? Who are you and what you done with Naruto Uzumaki? His former teacher demanded with a look of mock shock on his face. Very funny, Irika sensei very funny, he told him in a deadpan tone. Sorry, I couldn't resist. How about we go there for a bowl or two? It'll be my treat. He offered, hoping that he would accept. Sure, why not? He asked with a grin. I just got back from a mission, so I could go for a bowl. That's the Naruto Uzumaki I know. Irika told him with a smile as they walked out of the classroom, the papers lying on the table, forgotten. Location, Ichiraka Ramen. Welcome. Tochi called out as he heard people come in. His back was to them, so he couldn't see who it was. I'll be right with you so please take a seat. As the sound of chairs being moved filled the place, he stopped washing the dish in his hands and turned around. Now can I get, yeah? He asked, the question trailing off as he looked at who was sitting in front of him. I don't know about Irika sensei but I could go for a bowl of miso ramen. Naruto said, casually sitting in the chair. I'll have the same. Irika added. Tochi looked at Naruto, unable to speak due to the surprise. When he finally could, he turned to face the back. I am, out favorite customer is back. He shouted with joy in his voice. What? I am shouted in return. After listening to the sound of someone moving quickly through a kitchen, she appeared in the front, a look of hope, hope on her face. Is that you, Naruto? She asked the blonde sitting before her. As I told Irika-sensei, in the flesh. 
he replied with a grin. The grin disappeared with a yelp as he ducked his head to avoid a swipe of her ladle. What was that for? He demanded. You don't show up here ever since you got back, you don't even bother to drop in to say hi. She accused him, shaking her ladle at his face. Did you find someone who was better at making ramen? No. I didn't, I swear. Nothing can compare to a Chiraka ramen. He promised the two of them. The last thing he wanted to do was insult Ichiraku. Oh really? Asked Tuchi. And we're supposed to believe you? You, who didn't bother to come once during the Chunin exams. It's the truth. Besides, I haven't had ramen in three years. Why didn't you say so? I am asked, her angry mood completely disappearing. Both she and her father went to work making the ramen, serving it in record time. Naruto broke the chopsticks apart, quickly gave thanks, and dug in with gusto. Ah, still the best. He declared as he slurped down the noodles and the broth. Another one, please. Coming right up, Tuchi told him. You really should eat more slowly, Naruto. Irika told him as he ate his ramen. I can eat slowly, but like I said, it's been three years since I had ramen. I couldn't hold it in. He replied. Tuchi gave him another bowl and this time, he did it more slowly. The two of them enjoyed their meal with Naruto mainly telling him some of the things he's done. A couple of those things managed to make Irika laugh, which made him smile. You know, there is one thing that's kinda been bugging me ever since the Chunin exam. Oh? What's that? He asked him, curious. It didn't seem like a lot of things bugged bugged Naruto recently. How in the name of Kami in heaven above did you and the crazy snake lady get together? He demanded, pointing his finger at his former sensei, who could only stare him before laughing. Hey, don't laugh at me. It's a serious question. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't help it. He apologized as he tried to stop laughing. Well. How did you two get together? I'll be honest with you, Naruto, I'm not quite sure myself. But I think it started when she walked in on me when I was undressing in the academy bathhouse. The bathhouse was adjacent to the academy and was available to teachers after a rough day or just wanted to quickly clean up. She kept looking me over like I was a piece of prime meat. She wasn't embarrassed in the slightest. He could still remember her eyes roaming up and down his body while he stood in surprise, wearing only his underwear. But I'm guessing you were. Naruto asked with a grin. He would be too if he was in that situation, all he had in his experience was trying to make sure that fangirls didn't break down the door to the room he was in at the time and running for his life away from them. Of course, I was. After that, whenever we met, she kept giving my ass a squeeze and purring in my ear. Kurina usually had to pull her off of me. I eventually asked her if she wanted to go out sometime and she all but pounced on me. And how did the date go? Surprisingly well, actually. Irika admitted. She didn't try to molest or anything like that the entire time we were out. It was only after I walked her back home she started up again. He grinned. Let me guess, you tried to say goodnight and she pulled you into a round of tongue hockey? I haven't heard it be put like that, but yes. Then she dragged me up to her apart apartment. You must have completely worn out by the morning. He said with a chuckle. Of course, I was. His former teacher admitted, before giving his former student a grin that was a little perverted. But the sex was well worth it. That I don't need to hear. The blonde stated, looking away to focus on his ramen. Are you sure? He asked, the grin getting wider. It disappeared when they heard the faint sounds of feet stomping on the ground, a lot of them. What's that noise? He asked, not really expecting an answer. He got it when he heard Sasuke run past, screaming help. At the top of his lungs. What soon followed were the high-pitched squeals of his fangirls as they screamed his name and chased after him. If I had to hazard a guess, 
I would say that would be Sasuke getting punished for that prank he pulled back at the capital. Naruto nonchalantly said as he continued to eat his ramen, while everyone else in the restaurant looked at him with surprise. What did you do, Naruto? Iraka asked him. He shrugged, I just told them where he would be and that he wanted them. I had a clone shadow him until he was alone. Then I used a wireless radio to let them know his location. They took care of the rest. That's a little cruel, Naruto. I am accused him. Both she and her father had hidden Sasuke from his fangirls enough times to know how scary they really were. So was having a Shershu who hates my very existence and who would love to see me dead go after me for a laugh. He replied, looking her straight in the eye. This is just the return prank. Besides, I have to maintain my reputation as the best pranker in Kanoha. You're still the same as ever, Naruto. Iraka said with exasperation. I'll take, take that as a compliment, Iraka sensei He said with a mischievous grin, making the others laugh. But there was also another reputation that he had to protect, one that was absolutely mandatory. There was a reason Azula had silently called Sasuke an idiot. To her, since he had worked with Naruto before he left, he should have known and remembered the most important lesson of. You don't prank an Uzumaki. They will prank you back. Chapter 54, Grousing Intentions Location, Teen Paragon As they sat at a long table, the sounds of a bar during happy hour swirled around them and filled their ears. Drinks sat in the front of them, but they only occasionally drank from them. They were too busy waiting for the team from Kiri to join them. They were to do a joint mission together that would benefit both villages. For the past month or so, the team had been working hard at trying to figure out if what they thought of the Akatsuki was true. Jiraiya's spy network was doing the same thing and was working overtime on it. But it hadn't turned up much. At most, they were tracking down aliases and rendering them useless by finding the original person and getting everything they gave the Akatsuki. There had been a few times when they had the identity of a possible spy or informant, but every time they arrived, the person was either dead or gone. It was getting a little frustrating, if they were being honest with themselves. In the time they weren't on the missions, they were spending time in Kanoha. Asuma was a part of the group that was supposed to infiltrate Yukigekure, so he had left within a day of teams Kakashi and Paragon's return from the capital. Aside from that, the other teams were glad to spend time with Team Paragon. Saka and Akela were able to learn a great deal from Kiba and Akamaru about fighting as a team. Suki and Tenten, along with Lee and Choji, got in a good deal of sparring time, which helped the Kyoshi warrior figure out how to fight against Shinobi. Both Azula and Saka were able to put their wits up against Shikamaru and Sasuke, which helped sharpen them. Both Shino and Jun had been testing each other by trying to see who could find who the fastest, Jun with Nyla or Shino with his Kakechu, so far, the score was tied. But while they were interacting with the Shinobi, Naruto was doing his best not to. He was more than happy to do stuff with his own team, but when it came to the Kanoha 11, he did his best to stay away. He would occasionally get involved, like helping Saka against Shikamaru or Kiba, or even spar with one of them, but he tried to keep it to minimum. Azula and the others had often tried to bring him in on what they were doing. It worked with some success, but he staunchly refused to be anywhere near Team Kakashi. If it doesn't have to do with a mission, I won't be near them. He told them repeatedly. While he did not interact with the Kanoha 11, he did spend time with a few people in the village, mainly Iraka, Tuchi and Iam, and surprisingly, Team Ebisu. That last one happened when he had accidentally walked past them sparring in one of the training grounds. Flashback He watched in silence as Kanoamaru fell down to the ground, Udon standing over him. He should have seen that one coming. The QB commented in his head. No kidding. He agreed. You know, Kanoamaru, that sweep was obvious. He said aloud, surprising the three genin as well as getting their attention. You left your right open when Udon threw that kunai at you. You have to look underneath the underneath, remember? They didn't say anything in reply, 
they just stared at him in silence. Well, are you going to say something, or are you just going to stare at me? What are you, what are you doing here, Naruto? Kanoamaru asked him, finally speaking. He was nervous due to the fact that the last time they had met, the person standing in front of them warned them to stay away from him. Observing, he answered shortly. How, how long have you been in the village? Moegi asked him. Only a couple of days, we came back from the capital. We heard about that. You were there when the new daimyo was crowned. Udon told him. Although it sounded like a question, it wasn't one. He already knew the answer. She gave you the title of Shinobi Kikin. Yeah, she did. He noticed the looks on their faces, there were ones of doubt and uncertainty. What? Is it even right to call you that when you're not one anymore? Kanoamaru asked him, his tone almost accusatory. There's no such thing as an ex-shinobi. He replied, making the Sarutobi air stiffen slightly. His grandfather, the Sandame Hokage, had said those exact same words when he came out of the retirement after the Yandame Hokage had died. Just because I no longer have the title, doesn't mean I no longer have the training. And it's the training that makes it count. We remember. Udon said gloomily, remembering the day on the bridge. You proved that to us effortlessly. He looked them over again. When he had seen them in Kozan, they had hoped that he would come back with no problems, and everything would be back to the way it was. Now, they looked at him with suspect, doubt, and fear. It was like they didn't know what to think of him anymore. They didn't know if he was an enemy, a stranger, or even an ally. A small part of him felt hurt by that. I had to do it though. He thought to himself. If I hadn't, they would have come after me, and I would have been forced to kill them. I couldn't afford that. That was, was then, Kit. The QB told him, having listened in on what he was thinking. This is now. So, I've noticed. He replied with heavy sarcasm. But the fox's words did give him an idea. You guys want some tips? He asked Kanoamaru and his two teammates. Wa well, what? Asked a surprised Moegi. Both Kanoamaru and Udon were caught off guard by the question as well. You heard me, do you three want some tips on how to fight better? He asked them again. You, you mean it? Kanoamaru asked. Does it sound like I was kidding? The three of you need all the help you can get. He tried to be completely serious when he said it, but he couldn't help sound slightly humorous. They heard the humor in his voice and relaxed a little. We're glad you can help us, boss. Udon told him, only to cover his mouth after realizing he had unconsciously called Naruto boss. Kanoamaru and Moegi looked nervous as well, it sounded like they were still hoping that he would come back. All right, get back to sparring. He told them, acting like he hadn't heard Udon slip. The three smiled and raced back onto the field. End flashback. Azula, Saka, Ten Ten, and Shino soon found him watching them spar against one another, giving them tips on how to last longer or fight better. Although he probably would have never admitted it, Azula saw a ghost of smile on his face as he watched the three genin. She could tell he was a little happier. But despite the fact that they were making friends, or in the case of Naruto, keeping minimum contact, the threat of the Akatsuki, and their lack of a serious success hung over their heads and refused to leave them alone. They kept going but until Tsunade had called them into her office a few days earlier, it had looked like they weren't going to have any luck. Flashback A few hours ago, we received a message from the Mizukage. Tsunade told them as they stood in front of her desk. Apparently, Kiri has managed to locate the town where the underground auction is taking place. Place. What's the underground auction? Azula asked. It's an illegal event that's been happening since the Second Shinobi World War. Jiraiya explained, standing next to Tsunade. Organized crime has a yearly event where they auction off some of the valuable things they've obtained. One section is the items they procure from Shinobi. 
He used finger quotes to emphasize procure, they all knew what he actually meant when he said that. What kind of items? Naruto asked. He knew fully well that a shinobi item had the potential to be dangerous, and if it was in the hands of a capable person, that potential was realized. A very good example was Zabuza Momochi with the Kubikiri Bocho. That was downright terrifying to people who knew what that meant, to those who didn't, they either soon learned or were dead. Most of it is just your typical run-of-the-mill stuff that turns out to be completely false, a kunai that can effortlessly cut through the steel without the use of chakra, a scroll that has the power to seal a biju. That's the stuff that used to get rid of the small fry. The big fishes will go after the items that come out later because those are the dangerous ones. Why haven't you guys done anything about this auction? It seems the ideal place to recover lost items and get an upper hand over your enemies. Saka pointed out, having realized the potential of that scenario. The organizers of this thing have always been both smart and secretive. They keep moving the location, which they don't reveal until a few, a few weeks beforehand, and the catalog isn't released at all. The Toad Sage explained. You're only given a copy once you've arrived at the location. Usually, the only time I've been told about the underground auction's location was when it was already done, so it would be too late to send Shinobi in to stop it. Sounds like a lot of paranoid people. June commented. But what does this have to do with us? The last time the underground auction was held, one of my informants got lucky and was able to attend. While he was there, he saw someone in the crowd wearing an Akatsuki cloak. I checked his description of the man, and I can confirm it was the member known as Kakuzu. The team paid more attention after hearing that little tidbit of information. He did a little snooping and found out that Kakuzu has been attending the underground auction for the past 20 years. He's never bought anything but after each auction, a few of the auctioneers go missing. Did they have high bounties on their heads? Suki asked. She, as well as the others, had read up on all available information about the Akatsuki. They knew that Kakuza had a sense of greed that wasn't to the point of obsessiveness, but went straight past it. As such, he would go after people, civilian or shinobi, who had a big enough price on their heads. According to the information that the shinobi took from Orochimaru, Kakuzu often referred to himself as the treasurer of the Akatsuki. Every single one of them, he confirmed. But that gives us an opportunity. We go to this underground auction, we can possibly find Kakuzu. We find him, and we can take him out, thereby leaving the Akatsuki with one less member, and also possibly ruin their financial needs in the process. Azula summarized. That's correct. Tsunade agreed. Team Paragon, your mission will be to rendezvous with the Team Kiri, is sending and infiltrate the underground auction. You are to then kill any Akatsuki members you find at the time you deem appropriate. Are there any questions? I have one. A voice from behind them said as the door to the office opened. An old man walked in with the use of a walking stick. He wore a black robe that covered his right arm and left his other arm free to hold the walking stick. Underneath the robe was a white long-sleeved shirt. There was an X-shaped scar on his chin and underneath his black shaggy hair were bandages that covered his forehead and the right side of his face. I didn't summon you, Danzo. Tsunade told the man curtly. Forgive me, Princess Tsunade. He apologized, not sounding apologetic at all. When he had first spoken, only Azula had noticed that Naruto stiffened a little and a small look of panic and fear had briefly flickered in his eyes. It disappeared as soon as it arrived and he wore a neutral expression on his face. I must ask why you do not trust such a mission to a Kanoha team. Danzo asked. I'm going, Danzo. Jiraiya told him, folding his arms across his chest. Besides, Naruto and his team have agreed to help us with the Akatsuki. In that regard, they can be considered a Kanoha team. They are not shinobi of Kanoha. They are simply mercenaries you and Princess Tsunade hired. He retorted. Most of the members of Team Paragon felt insulted when he called them mercenaries. 
This mission is one of highest priority, therefore, a team of qualified shinobi should be the ones taking it. Would that team be from Root? The Toad Sage asked him. You'll have to forgive, forgive me if I don't find that reassuring. That is irreverent, Jiraiya. This mission should have Konoha Shinobi on it. And they will be. Tsunade told him. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. Enter. She ordered. The door opened and Anko walked in, right behind her was Yugo and Karen, wearing Konoha headbands. Yo. How's everybody doing? She greeted casually, wearing a big grin on her face. The crazy snake lady is coming with us? Naruto asked the mandatory rhetorical question. Yes I am. She declared. And these two knuckleheads are coming with. She gestured to Yugo and Karen. Anko-sensei, please stop calling me a knucklehead. Yugo asked her, embarrassed. I keep telling you, Yugo. I'll stop calling you one when you stop being one. She replied with a smile. Unlike Karen, she's a permanent knucklehead. She pointed her thumb at the person in question. Anko-sensei. Protested Karen. Hey, it's the truth and we both know it. HM, I see. Danzo said, bringing the attention in the room back to him. I have no further objections. I wish the Kanoha team good luck on their mission, and I hope they will remain skeptical of what outside parties say. He turned around, ignoring the looks team Paragon, minus Naruto, who tried to make sure he didn't even make eye contact, were shooting at him, and walked out of the office. Looks like he hasn't lost his sunny disposition, Jiraiya commented sarcastically. Kami, I detest that man. You and me both, Jiraiya, Tsunade told him, breathing out a sigh. Okay, just who in the name of the spirits was that guy? Saka demanded, his tone of voice sounding both furious and questioning. His name is Danzo Shimura. A long time ago, both he and Saratobi Sensei were candidates for the title of Hokage. Jiraiya explained. I don't think he's ever gotten over that loss. I'm guessing he's dangerous? Azula asked. Imagine a long foam who's a lot more subtle and a lot harder to double-cross. Naruto told her. Realization dawned on those who had been in Ba Sing Se. Long foam had been a somewhat dangerous enemy, they used somewhat because of how Naruto had easily pulled the rug out from under him after slowly usurping his power without him or them knowing, but the way they heard it, Danzo would have made him look like a rookie. However, a small part of their minds were also wondering how Naruto knew who Danzo was and how he acted. So, if we piss him off, we're in trouble. Jun stated. That would be putting it mildly. Tsunade replied. Most of the people who did that were enemies of Kanoha, and they weren't around long soon after. Hey, Gaki, Anko said to Naruto, uncharacteristically serious. Yes, crazy snake lady? He asked, turning to face her. I've got two things I want to do to you. She surged forward and buried her fist in his stomach. That was for killing Orochimaru. She told him as he fell to the ground. She then grabbed his collar, pulled him up, grabbed his face, and gave him a kiss full on the lips. They could tell that he wasn't a willing participant, due to the amount of struggling he was doing. And that was for killing Orochimaru. She told him after pulling away. He stumbled a little before regaining his balance. You kiss Irika sensei like that? He asked a little dazed. His question made Azula turn and glare at the jonin. Nope, kissing Irika usually involves a lot more tongue and us clawing each other's back. She replied with a grin. The dizziness went out when the window when he got that image in his head. Oh, I don't need to hear that. He protested, covering his ears. Hearing about his old teacher's sex life was something that he tried to avoid. You're the one who asked. She replied, still grinning. What was with that punch and kiss? June asked, finding Anko to be a little interesting. The punch was for him taking away my chance to kill Orochimaru myself. She explained. 
The kiss was for him killing Orochimaru. I was so happy when that happened, I ran Iraka ragged the entire night. Ard, what did I just say? Naruto demanded, trying to get the image out of his head. It was proving difficult to do so. Enko sensei please stop torturing him. Yugo told her. Are you kidding? Anko demanded. This is a golden opportunity. I have the ability to make the amazing shinobi kick and cringe and suffer like a little girl. She had been waiting for a chance to do this even before he got that name. Sensei, could we please just focus on the mission? Karen all but begged her. You guys are no fun. She pouted at them. That's why I assigned you to them, Anko. Tsunade spoke, getting her attention. Now will you pay attention, or are we going to have to hide Irika from you again? No. You don't need do that. She almost shouted. The last time that had happened, Irika had been hidden from her for a week. By the end of that same week, she was like a kid who had lost her puppy, and was practically groveling at Tsunade's feet for Irika's return, although, according to Irika, when she found had finally been told where he was, they had managed to redefine the term wild monkey sex. Good. Do you all understand what you're supposed to do? Yeah, we do. Naruto answered her, regaining his calm, even though his dignity took a dip. But I've got a question. What's Kiri's stake in all this? Don't know. You'll have to ask them yourself. She told him. You're all dismissed. She told them with authority. End flashback. I gotta tell ya, there is nothing as cheerful as a bar at happy hour. Anko declared as she watched the people around them. That is, of course, there's a bar fight. Are you planning on starting one, Anko? Naruto asked her as he took a drag from his cigarette. He decided to be professional while on a mission and call her by name instead of the crazy snake lady, the fact that she she would start recounting the sex life she and Irika have might have been an incentive for him to do that. We're focusing on the mission, Naruto, you can be sure of that. Yugo assured him. He was still weary of the paragon, but he was also thankful for what he did. Anko sensei won't start any fights. Yeah, she ends them. Karen added, taking a drink from the cup in front of her. Their sensei had led them into a number of fights, but they always came out victorious in them. Hey, Lord Jiraiya, are we sure that the team from Kiri is supposed to meet us here? Anko asked him. Fairly certain, considering I sent a messenger bird ahead of us. He told her. They should be arriving soon. He looked around the place and sprouted a lecherous grin when he noticed a woman sitting alone at a table. Well, hello there. Keep it in your pants, F.S. Sensei. Saka warned him. We're on a job here and neither Naruto nor I want to go hunting for you in the morning. They had done that plenty of times with Zuko during the month they spent in Ba Sing Se dealing with the creation of the fifth country. They had honestly lost count of the number of times they had to run away from angry boyfriends, even though Jiraiya kept saying the woman was completely willing and didn't object. I am well aware of that fact, Saka. He scowled at the tribesmen. Despite what you may think, I know when to rein it in. Could have fooled us, both he and Naruto said in unison. There was a reason I used to call you Erosenin. Naruto told the Toad Sage as he took a drag. Do you want to go a round of training with me later tonight? He threatened the blonde. No thanks, you're having fun with June. I'd hate to interrupt the process. June glared at him when he said that. It was still a painful memory for her. Jiraiya had decided to have the entire team train together, together, starting off by sparring against him. June had cockily declared that she could beat him easily. Within ten minutes, she had been easily beaten and Jiraiya hadn't even been trying. After that sparring session, he decided to be harder on her than the others. That decision led to her to start calling him a fucking sadist as well, when they heard that, both Naruto and Saka said welcome to the club. In any case, one of us should probably go outside and keep an eye out for the Kiri team. Suki suggested. 
We don't need to do that. Hell, we don't even need to move. Anko told her before looking over at Karen. Do your thing, Karen. She ordered her student. I'm going, Anko-sensei. I'm going. Karen replied, closing her eyes and concentrating her chakra. What exactly is she doing? Azula asked Anko. Karen has the ability to sense someone's chakra at a distance that exceeds six miles. She can also tell if someone is lying or under a jinjutsu. If she just focuses on one particular chakra, she can even tell their exact location and movements with a good amount of detail. She explained. Impressive. Naruto commented. What do you expect? She is your she was interrupted when Karen groaned loudly, getting everyone's attention. Why did they have to send him? Why? She moaned, placing her head on the table and cradling it with her hands. Do you hate me, Kami? Is that why you're torturing me like this? Uh, Karen, what's wrong? You go ask her. The Kiri team is here. Oh, that's good news, right? No, it's not. It's really not. She all but sobbed. Hey, it's not like I'm going to enjoy this either woman. So shut up. Suajetsu's voice told her as he and two others stopped in front of the table. He looked the same as they had last seen him with the only exception being he now wore a Kiri headband instead of a Kusa one. Behind him were Chojuro and someone they didn't know, even though his appearance was a little startling. For all intents and purposes, he looked like a younger Kisame Hashigaki. There were a few differences, his hair was, was flat and he lacked the gill-like facial markings. What did you say, idiot? Karen demanded, her personality doing a complete U-turn. Karen, calm down. Yugo told her. She didn't really want to, but she also knew that this wasn't the place to start one of their arguments. Suajetsu Hozuki I presume? Jiraiya asked. Yeah, that's me. He answered with a shrug of his shoulders. I see Chojuro is with you, but who is the third member of your team? He asked, looking at said member. This is Reimu. This is his first mission as a Chunin. He briefly introduced him. He hello, Chojuro greeted them nervously. Reimu didn't say anything. He just kept a stoic expression on his face. Before we get talking, let's go someplace a little quieter. Saka suggested, quickly looking around the place. I think we can all agree that we don't want anyone listening in on us. They understood where he was coming from. They had no idea if they were being watched right now or not. It was better to be safe than sorry when it came to the Akatsuki. Those who were sitting at the table stood up and walked away, with Jiraiya leaving the money for the bill on the table and Naruto stubbing out his cigarette. They walked out of the bar, getting the attention of Akela and Nyla, who stood up from where they laid on the ground and followed them. They made their way through the town's practically empty streets. They left the town and entered the surrounding forest. The sun was setting into the twilight as they found a su suitable spot to make camp. They broke up and did their respective chore. Jiraiya, Naruto, Yugo, and Anko collected the firewood while Suki, Chojuro, and Karen took the wood and got a fire going. Azula, Suijetsu, and Reima set up the tents. Saka, Jun, Akela, and Nyla were patrolling until everything was done. There were a few small arguments in the process which were mainly between those Kanoha and Kiri, and were about the little things, like how the tent should be set up or how the wood for the fire should be placed, but thankfully they didn't escalate into full-blown fights. They were soon done and seated around the fire. A pot hung over the fire with their dinner cooking in it. Silence reigned supreme as they waited for the dinner to cook, no one wanted to talk shop without a full stomach. Finally, Saka couldn't take it. Hey Naruto, he said, breaking the silence. Why don't you read a part of that story you're working on to us? Naruto was surprised by that question. They knew he was working on the novel, but he honestly didn't expect any of them to ask for him to read a piece of it. Are you sure about that, Saka? He asked. 
I'm still working on it. For all you know, it could be the most terrible thing you would ever hear. He shrugged. Sounds about right when it comes to you, he replied with a smirk, making some of the others chuckle. That's a point to him. Jiraiya noted. Nobody was actually sure who had the lead now in the point game, they were just doing for entertainment and lightening the mood when needed. But that doesn't sound like a bad idea, actually. If you read a part of what you've written, we can give you constructive criticism. He told Naruto. You guys sure about this? He asked the rest of the group. Eh, why not? Asked June. The others, minus the Kiri team, nodded in agreement. All right then, he pulled out the book and opened it up to the first page. Please bear in mind that this is still a work in progress. He warned them before reading the first page. The, cl the clouds in the sky above bulged with the threat of thunder and rain. Two cloaked strangers walked down an empty street. They were in the middle of a city, but the threat of rain and the fact it was evening had emptied out the street, that's a little unrealistic. Saka noted. There's always someone out on the street. Are we sure he's here? The smaller of the two strangers asked. His voice was little high-pitched and would squeak if he was riled up enough. According to the information they gave us, he's been here for at least two months. The second answered with a voice that sounded melodious. It was the kind of voice that stopped men in their tracks. He's been doing small jobs and spending most of his nights at a bar near his residence. That's the bar right there, isn't it? He pointed to a building just down the street from them, how convenient. June muttered. Shut up, June. I told you that this was a work in progress. Naruto snapped at her. Yeah, that's the place. They made their way over to the bar and stepped inside. It wasn't very crowded, as it was a weekday and most of the bar's patrons were at home. A couple sat at tables and one sat at the bar. But they weren't interested in them. What had their attention was a man sitting alone in a corner booth who looked to be in his mid-thirties holding a cup and contemplating it. Why would anyone be contemplating a cup? Suijetsu asked. It makes him look like he's deep in thought, idiot. Karen told him. Pardon me, but are you Shiro Ryu? The slightly smaller stranger asked him. He looked up at them, making the light overhead shine down on his fa face. His cheeks were slightly shrunken and his nose was a little pointed. His hair was cropped short but was also a little messy, like he had rolled out of bed and decided not to take a shower. He was clean-shaven and his eyes were the color of hard steel. But what stood out was the color of his hair. Most people would mistake for being platinum blonde at first glance, but it was actually pure white, geez, are you describing a fashion model or something? Anko asked. That actually wasn't bad, Gaki. Jiraiya complimented him. When he saw who was standing in front of him, he scowled. What's it to ya, shrimp? He asked rudely. I'm not a shrimp. The stranger bristled. He was a respectable height, but people kept annoying him by calling him any variations of short, do I sense a recurring theme here? Saka asked. What you sense is the punch I'll hit you with if you keep talking. Naruto threatened. Point for him, Azula noted. I call it like I see it. He said with a shrug of his shoulders. He would have yelled at the guy had he not felt his partner's hand on his shoulder. Calm down. The taller of the two ordered, her melodious voice taking a hard tone. Yes ma'am. He acknowledged, forcing himself to calm down. Good. She turned to face the man in the booth. I apologize for his behavior, Mr. Ryu. What do you guys want? He asked, ignoring her apology. We have business with you. She told him. May we sit down? He took a drink from the cup. Go ahead. They nodded their thanks and quickly sat down. So, who the hell are you two? You may call me singer. The woman said as she lowered her hood. Luscious black hair framed a heart-shaped face. 
Her eyes were purple in color, and they almost looked like they glowed. Her lips were rosy and full, they looked like they had worn many playful smirks that got a man's blood pumping, again with the fashion model description. Anko, Anko complained. Could you please use something else? This is Tusk. She introduced her partner as he lowered his hood. His face was plump, roundish and looked to be about 15 years younger than his partner and Shiro. He had a pug nose and it looked like he smiled a lot. He had shaggy brown hair and his eyes were the same color, finally, a different kind of description. Anko said with a sigh of relief. We're from the agency. When he heard the word agency, his skull darkened. Oh great, you guys. He said tensely. Why do you people insist on coming after me? You're the reason I have to keep moving from place to place. That's not fair. The heads left you alone for eight months before they started sending out people for you. She protested lightly. How generous of them, he replied sarcastically. Again, what do you guys want? There was a shadow of a smile on her lips before she settled with a professional look. There's a situation in a nearby country, and we require your help with it. No. Go away. He ordered. You haven't heard the rest of it. Tusk objected loudly, getting the attention of the other people in the bar. And I don't want to. You and your lot have been hounding me for the better part of two years with situations that require my help. This is your mess. You can clean it up without me. It doesn't concern me. Actually, this one does concern you. Singer told him, doesn't it always? Suki asked. Not always. Jiraiya disagreed. He turned to look at her. What? The country in question, the Land of Wings has been in political turmoil for the past five years. Recently it has turned bloody. There is fighting in the streets of every city and town in the country, and the death toll is mounting. It's getting to the point where an open rebellion will tear the country apart. And what does that have to do with me? Shiro asked. You were the one who started the whole thing. Tusk said his tone almost accusatory. He froze when heard that, the cup in his hand halfway to his lips. I beg your pardon? He said. Tusk, Tusk, don't talk until I tell you to. Singer ordered her partner, who was about to speak again. He reluctantly closed his mouth, but still looked at Shiro with distaste in his eyes. Sorry about that. She apologized to Shiro. He wasn't interested in the apology. What did he mean about it being my fault? He demanded. She threw a brief glare at Tusk before sighing briefly. You were active in the land of wings a few months before the turmoil began. Naturally, some people at the agency believe it's your fault just because of that. Both of them looked at Tusk after she said that. It was clear that he was one of those people. With what happened to you two years ago, you can slip into the country and see if you can quell the turmoil while also putting a leader on the throne that would be beneficial to all. You mean beneficial to you and the agency? He accused. He had the feeling that that was one of the reasons they came to him for this instead of one of their own. And how exactly would what happened two years ago be beneficial to me? With the loss of your memories, you can pretend that you remember something vague about the Land of Wings. Therefore, you can use that as an excuse while you complete the mission. I see. Things fell silent as they just sat there. Both Tusk and Singer watched him as he fiddled with the cup in front of him. Some of the other people in the bar got up and left, saying that they needed to get home. Outside, the clouds opened up and dropped the rain they were holding in. There was the occasional boom of thunder, but no one re really paid attention to it. As the rain pattered down on the ground, Shiro finally lifted the cup and took a drink. No. He stated, lowering the cup. What? Tusk asked, surprised at the answer they were given. I said no. I already told you, this is your mess, you can clean it up. Mr. Shiro, please reconsider. He all but begged. 
Shiro looked over at him and stared directly into his eyes. Tusk could only shrink into his seat when he saw that look. All intents and purposes, Shiro honestly looked like a dragon that was a step away from being really angry at him. It was enough to make any sane man very nervous, if not downright scared for his life. But while Tusk was trying to become one with the seat, Singer could only smile at the situation. That's the Shiro Ryu I remember. She thought with fondness. She couldn't let those thoughts run rampant, she had to remain professional. The heads of the agency realized that you might say, considering how many times you've refused us before. So they gave us an additional order, we are to accept any price you give in order for you to take this offer. She told Shiro. He turned his gaze over to her, surprised etched on his face. Any price? He repeated, unsure if she meant it. You're sure about that? Yes, I am. She answered confidently. Then consider yourself lucky. I'll take your damn offer and accept the mission. Excellent, what is your price? She asked with a smile. I think you know my price. He replied with a scowl. I woke up two years ago in a hotel room with only these to tell me who the hell I was. He showed them his arms so they could see the black triangles on each wrist. Although they didn't see it, both Singer and Tusk knew there a third triangle in between his shoulder blades. I didn't know what they meant until a prisoner who was about to be killed asked to see me and told me what they meant. I had no idea what happened to me during my, my life because the last thing I remember before waking up that day was entering the academy, when I was nine. He looked her straight in the eye. You want my help? This is my price, your damn agency took my memories. I want them back. Naruto closed the book and looked around the campfire. The others looked at him in silence. Well, what do you think? He asked hesitantly. That was interesting. Yugo admitted. I would certainly get the book to see if the rest of it is just as good. It still needs a little work. Jiraiya stated. But you're not rushing it. You're taking your time and making sure that nothing is wrong. That's the best thing you can do with the story right. Everyone more or less agreed with what Yugo and Jiraiya had said, only the Kiri team kept silent. I'm glad everyone seems to like it. Naruto said with a small smile. He had been working on the novel and its characters ever since he, Azula, and Zuko had come back from Ba Sing Se. He was trying something he hadn't done before so he was little nervous about how people would receive it. While he wouldn't have committed suicide if they had said it bad or anything else along those lines, he still would have been hurt. Are we done with this crap? Raymo asked, finally speaking. We have more important things to worry about some damn book. If that's how you feel, you should have said something before he opened the book. Azula told him, bending a small fireball in her hands, hands, ready to attack. Naruto noticed the fireball and shook his head slightly at her. She glared at him slightly, but she extinguished the fireball all the same. She knew that the teams from Kanoha and the team from Kiri had to work together, not fight with one another. Knock it off, Reimu. Suojetsu ordered, getting a glare from him. Hey look, the food's done. Saka cried aloud, getting their attention. Let's eat. He poured himself a serving and began eating with gusto. The others joined in and as they ate, they were mentally thanking him. He had managed to head off a potential fight by distracting them with the reminder that they hadn't eaten. The silence in the camp was only broken by the sounds of eating. The food was hot and good, that was the only things it needed to be at that point. Once they were all full, the bowls in their hands were set aside, and they got down to business. So where is the underground auction being held? Jiraiya asked, getting straight to the point. It was that simple fact was the only preventing the Kanoha teams from going there themselves. According to our sources, it's being held in a city called Masu. Suijetsu told them. It's on the coast of the Land of Rivers, and it is practically right next to the Land of Fire. I know that place, there's a restaurant there that makes some good dango. 
Anko commented. Sensei, you know a lot of places that make good dango. Karen told her, making it sound like they had this conversation before. Are you sure it's going to be in Masu? Jiraiya asked. He knew from personal experience that it never hurt to double-check information. He knew Masu was big enough to be able to hold the underground auction, and the place was widely known for its trout, which anyone could use as an excuse to go there. Our sources are reliable, Lord Jiraiya. Chojuro assured him, trying not to sound unsure of himself. They told us it was in Masu. Was there any word on the day of it? He shook his head. Unfortunately, that was one thing they couldn't give us. That's okay. I'll have my contact do a check, just to be sure. Your own contact. Suajetsa repeated. He nod nodded. I have an informant in Masu. He can help us with this when we get there. How many informants do you have? He demanded. Jiraiya's spy network was legendary to shinobi who didn't hail from Kanoha. They didn't really know who the spies were, mostly because Jiraiya never really told anyone their identities. Why should he have to tell you, moron? Karen demanded in return. Shut up, harpy. I wasn't talking to you. He shouted at her. I could be wrong, but this sounds like the start of a beautiful marriage. Yugo commented quietly, but with a smile. The arguing immediately stopped as everyone looked at him in surprise. Did, did Yugo crack a joke? Jiraiya asked. In the time he had known the kid, he always seemed to be the straight man. Yes. My little student made a joke. Anko answered with a big grin. She grabbed Yugo and pulled him into a big hug. I'm so proud. Yugo made a funny. Sensei, please let go of me. He told her, but she wouldn't listen. It finally took both Jiraiya and Naruto to pry her away from him. Sorry, Yugo, she apologized as they sat back down. But come on, when you first became my student, it was almost impossible to make you smile. Now here you are making jokes. I'm so happy, I could cry. Please don't, we still need to know one thing, and a sobbing woman would really kill the mood. Azula stated drilly. Um, what's that one thing you need to know? Chojuro asked, a little nervous. What exactly does Kiri stand to gain in this mission? I hardly doubt you worry much over the Akatsuki taking Naruto, so there must be another reason. The Kiri team shared a look. I knew we forgot something in that message. Suajetsu commented with a snap of his fingers. We didn't forget. We left it out on purpose. Reimu growled. And now we're, we're going to tell them. He replied, his tone brokering no objections. He turned back to face the other teams sitting around the fire. When our sources told us the location of the underground auction, they also told us of a vague rumor. That rumor is the reason the Mizukage sent us on this mission. What's the rumor? Saka asked. That the remaining swords of the seven shinobi swordsmen, Nuwabari, Kabutawari, Shibuki and Kiba, had been found, and that they would be at the auction. Our orders are to investigate that rumor, and if it's true, do everything in our power to get them and bring back to Kiri. Chojuro answered. The members of the Kanoha teams who knew what those swords meant to Kiri, and they also knew the implication of that village having all seven again. It would make them a force to be reckoned with again, and could also make them a useful ally. This isn't just Reimu's first mission as a chunin. Suajetsu said, clapping a hand on his shoulder. He's a candidate for the seven shinobi swordsmen. If we succeed in this mission, he's one of us. Get your hand off of me, Hozuki. Reimu snapped, grabbing the offending hand with his own and yanking it off. Suajetsu was offended but did nothing or said anything in return. Chojuro looked angry and was about to say something, but Suajetsu shook his head in the negative and motioned him to stay put. All right, that's a good reason. Jiraiya admitted, standing up from where he sat. I'll go write a message for Kanoha, informing Tsunade of this. 
I'll help you write it. Anko stood up and followed him into one of the tents. That was the silent signal for everyone that the meeting was over. Both Saka and June stood up and told the others that they were going back on patrol with Akela and Nyla. Suki joined them, leaving the rest at the fire. So, Suajetsa said to Yugo and Karen, breaking through the awkward silence. Silence. How have the two of been? We've been fine. Yugo answered while Karen kept silent. Anko-sensei has been helping me control my anger. How the hell does she do that? He asked as he began drinking from his water bottle. He knew that there were very few, if any at all, people who could control Yugo when he lost control. If you weren't one of those people, your best option would be to run. She has a snake whose bite causes paralysis. Whenever I lose control, she simply has it bite me and I become paralyzed. After that happens, she has me try and mentally force the rage down, making myself calm. Sounds like a handful. He whistled. Anko-sensei believes in a hands-on approach. Karen told him before both she and Yugo shuddered. Some, if not most, of Anko's teaching methods could only be described as torture. When they told her that, she would always tell them the same thing. Would you rather train under Lord Jiraiya? Having heard tales of how he trained his students, they declined the offer every time. What about you, Suijetsu? Yugo asked his former teammate. I thought you were taken back to Kiri to be imprisoned. Well, I was. He admitted. Then the weirdest thing happened about two months ago. Flashback. He floated around in the capsule they put him in. It was completely airtight, so he couldn't get out and it was filled with water. They knew that he wouldn't drown, so they put a chemical in the water that made him feel sluggish and unable to think of a plan to get out. He had lost track of time in the capsule. In all honesty, he was content to just drift in the water. A hissing sound began to fill the capsule. Ha! Huh. What's that? He silently asked himself. As the hissing continued and got louder, he slowly noticed noticed that the water level in the capsule was going down. As it got lower, the chemical in the water drained out, letting him think clearly again. What the hell is going here? He thought to himself. He tried to look through the glass, but it was a one-way mirror. While he could only see himself, the people on the outside could see him clearly. When the water was finally all gone, the glass began to rise up all around him. When it was high enough, he stumbled forward and fell onto the ground with a wet smack, naked as the day he was born. Ow. That hurt. He groaned to himself as he struggled to his knees. He saw three pair of feet in front of him. Looking up, he saw the Mizukage, Ao, and Chojuro standing over him. Oh great, you guys. You will be respectful to Lady May. Ao ordered him. Why should I? I'm not a Kiri Shinobi anymore. But you were once, and that is why I stand before you now, Suijetsu Hozuki. May told him. What? You're going to make me a Kiri Shinobi again? He asked sarcastically. You abandoned your village and consorted with Orochimaru, a well-known criminal. He scoffed. You call it consorting, I call it being kidnapped and being experimented on. He was still embarrassed by the fact that Orochimaru had captured him easily. If his brother was alive, he would never let him live it down. You do not deny the charges? She asked, looking like she was the example of a calm woman. What does it matter? You're going to kill me anyway. This is Kiri we're talking about here. It's either kill or be killed in this village. This is not the bloody mist you once knew, Suijetsu. Chojuro told him, trying to be friendly. We're a new Kiri, a different one. Now why do I have a hard time believing you? He asked rhetorically before shr shrugging his shoulders. What does it matter in the end? I'm a criminal in Kiri's eyes, so I'll be executed to remind other shinobi the penalty of abandoning your village. He placed heavy sarcasm on the word abandoning. I am the Mizukage. May told him. 
I will be the one who decides whether or not you will be executed. He looked up at her and saw that she meant every word she said. The woman radiated both confidence and power. He could see why the people of the village had elected her as the leader after the civil war that had almost torn the land of water apart. But he was still skeptical of what she said. So, you are going to re-enlist me as a Kiri Shinobi? He said with an accusatory tone. She shook her head. No, I'm going to give you a choice. She turned to look at Chojuro, who nodded and handed her the Kubikiri Bocho. She took and held up in the air, the blade pointing to the ceiling. This is the Kubikiri Bocho, one of the swords of the Seven Swordsmen. It has a bloody past, but has always served the village until Zabuza Momochi took it away with him. When he died, it was left as a grave marker on his grave. You took it from there, but you did not serve Kiri with it. You served Orochimaru with it until Zabuza's spirit took it from your hands and gave it back to me. Does this monologue of yours have a point, or are you just trying to bore me to death? He asked, scratching the side of his face. Her answer was to swing the sword down and slam it point first into the floor, half an inch away from his face. Holy hell, she could have killed me. He mentally screamed. I am giving. I am giving you this choice, Suijetsu Hozuki, you will either be executed by this sword, or you will take this sword, and the title of Kirigakure no Kijin, Demon of the Hidden Mist, and serve Kirigakure as one of the Seven Swordsmen. She spoke with a tone of absolute authority. What do you choose? He stared at the blade for what seemed, in his mind, to be a long time. What would you have me do if I took the sword? He asked quietly. Protect the village? Is that all I would do? No, it would not. She answered, making him look up in surprise. One swordsman cannot defend the village, and neither can two. Should you take the sword, your mission will be to find shinobi worthy to carry the swords and defend the village. It will also be your mission to find the rest of the seven swords and bring them back home, where they belong. She looked him straight in the eye. Do you accept this mission, or will the Kubikiri Bocho taste your blood? The entire room was silent as the two of them had a staring contest. Both Ao and Chojuro waited quietly for Suijetsu's answer. They got it when he looked away from the Mizukage's gaze and began to stand up on shaky knees. He stood up to his full height and grabbed hold of Kubikiri Bocho's hilt. He pulled it out of the floor and held it in front of him with both hands, the tip pointing down. I accept the mission, Lady Nazukij. You have a swordsman and a demon. End flashback. And that's what happened. He finished. I've been working with this guy ever since. He pointed at Chojuro with his thumb, which made the guy look embarrassed. Who would have thought an idiot like you would actually end up being of the seven shinobi swordsmen? Karen asked, both rhetorically and sarcastically. But she was impressed, she just didn't want to show it to him. Unfortunately for her, he saw right through it. I'll take that as a compliment. Compliment. He said with a grin, showing all of his teeth. To think the Mizukage gave a traitor one of the swords. Reimo muttered to himself while the others were talking. It's enough to make any loyal shinobi sick. His muttering was loud enough for everyone at the fire to hear him. Did you say something, Reimu? Chojuro asked. I said the fact that Lady May gave a fucking traitor the position of one of the seven swordsmen is enough make me to sick. He said in a louder voice, standing up. Just looking at him with the Kubikiri Bocho strapped to his back makes me want to puke. He pointed angrily at Suijetsu. I'm no traitor. Suijetsu replied calmly, although they could tell he was trying not to get angry. Who was the one who left the village for a criminal? I told you already, I didn't leave. I was kidnapped. Oh, of course you were. He replied with obvious and heavy sarcasm. You were kidnapped and didn't try to come back to the village. If I had tried to escape, Orochimaru would have killed me. You know that. Ha! Huh. A likely story. So not only are you a traitor, you're a coward too. 
You're out of line, Reimu. Suajetsu shouted, standing up and raising a hand to Kobikiribocho's hilt. And you don't belong in the village. You should have been executed. He shouted in return, holding a kunai in his hand. It looked like they were about to fight one another when Chojuro stood up. That's enough. He bellowed, getting in between them. They weren't sure if Jiraiya or the others heard him. But if they did, they pretended not to hear it. Reimu Tuken, put that kunai away and take a walk, you need to cool off. Suajetsu, get your hand away from that hilt. You both know how important this mission could be. What we don't need is either one of you getting into fights. If this happens again, I'm sending the both of you back to Kiri with the recommendation that Suajetsu be relieved of his position as a swordsman and Reimu be stripped of his candidacy. Is that clear for both of you? He asked the two of them. Even though it was a question, it was a question that demanded an answer. It's clear. Reimu growled, putting the kunai back in his pouch and stomped away into the forest. Chojuro turned his gaze onto Suajetsu. The shy, nervous kid had been replaced by a confident shinobi who expected nothing but the best from his teammates and didn't tolerate fighting between them. Yeah, it's clear. Suajetsu answered before grinning. Man, you are definitely the Kirigakure no Hagosha, guardian of the hidden mist. That compliment was enough to send Chojuro away from the confident look he had and make him embarrassed for the praise. Hey, Suajetsu, Naruto said. Both he and Azula had kept their silence throughout the entire thing, respecting the fact that this was both friends getting back together and a dispute that required no outside intervention, something both Karen and Yugo realized too. But now, there was something that needed to be asked. I have a question about Reimu. What about him? He asked as both he and Chojuro sat back down. Is Tuken his actual clan's name? Yes, it is. Chojuro answered. He got it from his father. Oh, I see. I'm only asking because, well. You're asking the question because he's almost a spitting image of Kisame, right? Suajetsu asked, cutting him off. He knew where this conversation was going. How did you know? Azula asked curiously. It was obvious, I could see the question on your faces. And it was the same question I had when I first met him. He answered. Then, who exactly is he? Naruto asked. Chojuro already told you when he answered your question about his clan's name. But if you want me to spell it out, then fine. Reimu Tuken is not the son of Kisame Hashigaki. He took a long drink from his water bottle. He's his nephew, and he hates his uncle with a passion. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.